start live now. Yeah. Point you in thirty seconds. Good afternoon, everyone from Kerry. Uh, welcome everyone to the second annual John McCarthy AI Summer School. I'm Liam Cronin, CEO of the RDI Hub here in the beautiful Killorgan, County Kerry. In RDI Hub, we connect tech entrepreneurs and innovators to accelerate business growth. Everything that we do focuses on creating new products and services, job creation and new companies, whether through helping startups off the ground with the NDLC programs 
are co-creating to are co-creating a bespoke innovation program for corporates. The RDI Hub is a public-private partnership with Fexico Private Enterprise, Muscle Technology League University Research Partner, Kerry County Council from a local government perspective, with Enterprise Ireland funding through the Regional Enterprise Development Fund. Today and tomorrow is a gathering of the brightest minds in artificial intelligence right now. Last year's inaugural AI Summer School looked at AI for sustainability, and this year we will deep dive into the area of AI for wellness with core and applied research tracks. The renowned Stanford professor Andrew Ying has said, just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today I actually have a hard time thinking of the industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. So it will be insightful to understand the AI impact on our physical, mental and social well-being over the next two days. I'm really excited and looking forward to you joining keynotes, cleaner lectures, our first research colloquium with Munster Technological University and roundtable discussions. There will be opportunities to meet and network with other professors, postdocs, PhD students, researchers and startup founders in the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics. We're really delighted that this year's summer school is powered by our founding partners, or the IHUB here in Kilorgan, Microsoft, Munster Technological University, and its SFI Adapt Center for AI-driven digital content technologies. And it's a privilege to be, and we're delighted to welcome new partners to this year's summer school, Tangent Trinity IDs Workspace and AA Ireland. So finally, our roots here in Kilorgan are very much cemented in artificial intelligence, with the building here in RDI Hub dedicated to John McCarthy. John McCarthy, the father of artificial intelligence, who created the LISP programming language, the standard programming language used in robotics and other scientific applications, and, a multi and in a multitude of internet-based services. John McCarthy's father immigrated from Cremont, just out the road here, 10 kilometers in fact, uh, uh, where, we, where, where the RDI Hub is based. And in 2020, when John's grandchildren came over here for the launch of the RDI Hub, uh, it was great to see the dedication to their grandfather proudly placed at the entrance of the RDI Hub. So we're delighted to honour John McCarthy uh, over the next two days. So without further ado, I would encourage you to lean in, engage, enjoy the two days, and I'm now going to hand you over to Radian O'Connor, your MC and Master Coordinator for the event. Hello everybody, I'm Radeen, I'm the Community Manager here in RDI Hub and over the next two days, like Tim said, we're going to explore cutting edge research in the areas of AI for wellness that is reshaping our future. You will hear keynotes and roundtables from speakers from Stanford, DCU, the University of Agar in Norway, University of Sheffield, Munster Technological University, TU Dublin, Trinity and the US Special Operations Command. You will meet some of the greatest professors, postdocs, PhD students and researchers doing both core and applied research in the area of AI for wellness right now. Today, you are in for a treat. First to the stage in RDI Hub is Assistant Professor at Trinity College Dublin, Dr. Connor McGinn, and he will be talking to us about data-driven cleaning. Never was there a time that was more important. Then we have Dr. Heidi Christensen zooming in from University of Sheffield um, and she will join us at 2 p.m. to talk about how speech signal technology could be used to advance healthcare. You will get an opportunity to have a more intimate deep dive discussion with both Dr. Connor McGinn and Dr. Heidi Christensen at the breakout sessions from uh, 2.45 to 3 o'clock. And we will have a short coffee break before Dr. Morten Goodwin will join us from the University of Agger in Norway to present on the obvious secrets to making AI for wellness. And we will finish the day on a high with Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos from the United States of America joining us to present at 4 p.m. on the emerging artificial intelligence wellness landscape, those opportunities and the areas for great debate. So lots of time in there for Q&A. So as we're going through the presentations, make sure that you go into the button on your top of your screen, top right on your screen, pop your questions in the Q&A and we will find them and um, make sure they're answered. 
if you get lost, if you're having technical issues, anything like that, hit us up on the chat and Kerry will sort you out. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Liam to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Rudy. So, look, I'm delighted to welcome to the RDI Hub in Kilorgan, uh, Dr. Conor McGain, Assistant Professor in Trinity, who will discuss, as Radine was said, something extremely topical, data-driven cleaning, new approaches to room disinfection to improve wellness. Uh, Dr. Conor McGain is an assistant professor and co-founder of the Robotics and Innovation Lab, RAIL, in Trinity College, Dublin. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in robotics. Conor is passionate about robots and has particular interest in robot design, human-robot interaction, and artificial intelligence. Dr. McGinn's primary area of research concerns the design and control of service robots. He holds several patents related to the design of robotics, and his work has been recognized with numerous awards, including the Civic Engagement Award 2018, the Provost Scholarship at Trinity College Dublin in 2018, and the external awards include Engineers Ireland Technology Innovation of the Year Award in 2015. He collaborates widely with industry and universities in Ireland, Europe, South and North America, and Australia. Connor, welcome to the Kerry, welcome to the Kingdom. Great, delighted to have you here. Um, I've already learned so much about your research this morning on our drive out from Killarney after you arrived, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation over the next while. So I'm going to hand over to Connor to present. Thanks, Connor. Thank you, Liam, um, and thank you uh, for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, my name is, is Conor McGinn, uh, as you heard, and for the past six years I've been an assistant professor in Trinity College Dublin where I've led the, the research programme in robotics. The motivation for our group um, when we set it up um, was to harness the potential of robotics and artificial intelligence and apply them in a way that improved people's quality of life and well-being. We became particularly interested in developing technologies that supported older people. We all have experience of a person in our family or in our lives getting older and losing their independence and seeing the toll that that takes. Uh, and even though that there are technology solutions out there, they tend to be inaccessible um, or using them might stigmatize their users. So this is something that we felt we, we had the potential to address. And this led us to the development uh, of a robot that we, um, we call Stevie. You'll see it there. Um, Stevie is a social robot uh, that we developed for use in nursing homes. Initially, our goal was to make it facilitate group social activities like bingo and quizzes that deliver a lot of value, uh, but unfortunately can't take place very frequently due to chronic staffing problems in the sector. Once we succeeded in achieving this, uh, our goal was then to increase the functionality of the robot to do more practical tasks, as well as explore its, explicit, as well as explore its applicability uh, to support cognitive uh, therapy for the treatment of, of people living with dementia. Uh, as part of this process of exploring the new tasks, uh, we spoke to nursing home operators, not just in Ireland, but also in the UK, the US, Japan, and as far away as Australia. Um, and during these conversations, one of the first questions I asked uh, you know, these operators was, what were the kind of problems that were keeping them up at night? And again and again, I heard the same thing. People were talking about infections. Uh, from these conversations, I learned that residents uh, have in, uh, that have infections tend to be isolated. Um, and they, they tend to, uh, that, the, the process of looking after them requires substantially more care. Uh, and that, of course, involves more staff time. Uh, and as we all know, infections spread very, very easily. Um, so quickly, this problem can multiply and become overwhelming, especially if the organization is understaffed, uh, which is quite common. It also has very serious long-term consequences for these organizations, because if a nursing home develops a bad reputation for being somewhere where infections spread or has, having poor infection uh, prevention and control, then um, very often what happens is that people choose not to send their loved ones there, and this can affect the long-term viability of the organization. Uh, so it's no surprise then that this is causing operators to get worried. At more or less the same time uh, as this, we started to see articles like this one, uh, which appeared in the, the New York Times around 2018. Um, and as discussed in this article, another problem with infections, as we know, is that the germs that cause them, they lurk around, they stay in the environment for a very long time. And this means that even after you know, a resident has recovered from an infection, all it takes is just one more person to come in and touch a contaminated surface, and then we're back to square one. Um, so without effective and frequent room disinfection in place, um, this is a loop that continuously repeats itself. And it's one, of course, that's, that's very concerning. And it's a problem that isn't specific to nursing homes. This has plagued hospitals for years. Um, little, it's a little known fact that, in fact, infections contracted in hospitals, they kill more people on our, uh, than, than road traffic accidents on our roads uh, each year. 
and they lead to as many as 16 million bad days a year just in Europe. Um, and when economics, when e economists look at this and the statistics from um, the World Health Organization, it's estimated to cost the European economy uh, more than 7 billion annually in, in direct costs alone. Um, and at this point, we had an idea um, linking together what we were doing with robotics with the idea that robotics and AI could be used um, to address the, the problem with, with, with infections. Um, you know, what if we put uh, germ, kill, germ killing UV lights on Stevie? And what if we have him patrol the facility at night, uh, disinfecting things like buttons and elevators and other high touch surfaces that we see regularly in communal parts of the facility? We thought it might look something like this you see behind me, uh, whereby we have a standard, you know, Stevie uh, mounted to it, um, some, some UV lights that can be placed on us um, again after hours when, when th the place is a bit quieter. Um, but before we went ahead and built this, we needed to see if it was viable and we needed to look into more about the science of, of cleaning itself. Um, and this started a new journey, a new chapter in, in the research that we've been doing in our lab. Um, before I go too deep into it, uh, the first thing I'd like to make a note of is the difference between cleaning and disinfection. Even though sometimes they're used interchangeably, uh, they do mean different things. When we talk about cleaning, uh, we're generally referring to the process whereby we remove large particulates uh, from the room. That's typically dust or dirt, uh, or in, in the case of a hospital, it's blood. Um, and these are typically things we can see with our eyes. On the other hand, when we talk about disinfection, uh, we're generally referring to uh, the process of killing microorganisms. These are things like bacteria and virus and fungus. They're of course much smaller and we can't see those uh, with, our, with, our, with our eyes. These are typically only a few microns. Uh, and most commonly, we perform cleaning and disinfection at the same time. Uh, what happens is that we get a cloth or a mop uh, and we soak it in bleach or some other kind of chemical disinfectant and we then physically move it across the surface. And what happens is, or the process that, that happens is that the cloth will physically remove the larger particles while the chemicals seep into the surface uh, and kill the germs that way. It's simple, right? Um, the issues start to emerge though when you, you actually look at what happens on the ground. Um, very often when we're cleaning and removing the, 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 the dirt, the cloth doesn't need to be very wet. You know, just a damp cloth will do. On the other hand, when we're dealing with disinfection, we need to actually have a lot more uh, chemicals there. Um, and as a result, what, what often happens is that oh, as you start to rub the, the cloth on the surface or the mop on the surface, as it dries out, the whole, um, the whole area you're trying to clean, it, it gets saturated at different rates. Um, and when we see chemical disinfectants claiming, you know, 99 or 99.9% .9 effectiveness, what they mean is that it, it only happens at that level if uh, the surface is wet, typically for a period of around 10 minutes. And when we're cleaning facilities and only parts of the, the room are getting wet for that amount of time, then we have a situation where it looks like it's clean. And if you're in a room that's been cleaned by bleach, it smells like it's clean. But in fact, when you go to measure the microbial load on surfaces, you see inconsistencies um, there. And there's been numerous studies that have shown that. The second issue is that the use of, of cloth brings a problem because, of course, when we're at home and we're cleaning, um, when the cloth gets dry, we typically take the same cloth and dip it in the same bucket. But in a hospital setting, that's not allowed because it inter if there was germs on the surface and you dip it in the bucket, as it were, you're contaminating what's in the bucket. So each time you have to wet the cloth, you need to use a new cloth. Uh, and of course, in a place like a hospital, this is going to drive consumables through the ceiling if you're doing this at every time you dip. So as a result, um, one of two things happens, either the cloths run too dry or um, typically what will happen is that the, the, there's just not enough cloths, you'll run out, uh, in which case, you know, you won't clean the full room. Um, a third issue arises, and that's not all chemical disinfectants are, are effective against all microorganisms. Increasingly, we're seeing microorganisms emerge, things like gram-positive C. diff, uh, that are resistant to chlorine. So even if we do saturate it long enough, um, it, it's not going to actually kill the germs. And finally, all of this is time consuming. It's hugely time consuming. If you look at the room you're in right now and you're to imagine how long it would take you to rub every surface on it with a cloth uh, and mop every bit on the floor, you know, that starts to that starts to add up. Uh, and this is hugely problematic, especially in frontline services like in operating rooms, as you can see behind me. Um, and in settings like this, they're especially complicated because you're not just dealing with nice flat surfaces, you're dealing with things that are dangling from the roof, you're dealing with monitors that very often, you know, need a separate or a different type of disinfectant. Um, and also in operating rooms, most things are on wheels. So every time you go to clean, they're in a different place. So it's very hard to build any kind of pattern or routine. Uh, and the operating rooms that you see in hospitals, they don't look like this. You know, this is a marketing picture. What operating rooms actually look like is this. 
And what's happening is, is that in order for us to do operations frequently, in order to maintain capacity, these rooms are not being cleaned and they can't be cleaned using current methods uh, as fast as we'd like them to. And as a result, you know, when we clean the room, we're not fully removing it from of these germs. Uh, and commonly what happens is that the, the task of cleaning these rooms, again, because of staffing, it takes so long, it falls on one or two people. And you can do one, there's a trade-off. You can either clean it, but it will take you, in a room in a case like this, it would take two hours to do. Or you could, you could clean it half, not as well as it should, it might take 15 minutes, but there's a substantial chance that someone will get an infection who uses the room afterwards. And as we saw from the previous slide, if you get an infection, you're likely to spend two and a half times longer in hospital than you otherwise would, which again comes back to the pressure on the healthcare system. So cleaning the way we're currently doing it, it's an impossible job. We're fighting a battle against an invisible energy using weapons that we have no idea are working or not. Um, it, it's, it's a hard problem, but fortunately there's hope. We know that up to 70% of infections in hospitals can potentially be prevented through the use of PPE, proper hygiene practices, such as uh, social distancing and hand washing, as well as thorough disinfection. And there is technology out there that can help. One example would be uh, an autonomous um, floor scrubber, as you can see in, in the slide here. These can ensure that the floors constantly stay clean. And cleaning floors is one of the most time consuming jobs because in a hospital, there's really just so much uh, surface area on, on the ground. Unfortunately, things like this don't do well in cluttered settings and in settings where there's lots of objects around, you know, of course, it's not going to clean objects under them. So it's still not a, a perfect solution. We also see um, vaporized disinfection systems, and these are helpful because they don't just work on surfaces, they kill pathogens in the air as well, which of course, in the time of COVID, this is particularly applicable. The downside of these is that they require a lot of room set up because of course you don't want this sneaking into the, the ventilation system. Uh, so it can take several hours to, to ventilate. Also, you don't want to have people in the room at the same time, so you need to evacuate the rooms. Uh, and equally, the, the chemicals do leave a residue, meaning that you can't really have computers or electronics in the room at the same time. Uh, so again, there's drawbacks for this. Ultraviolet light technology. Um, this is something that has, has emerged a lot throughout the pandemic because it has some really, really amazing features. Uh, it operates by shining a special type of light uh, that when it interacts with microorganisms, it damages, it damages their DNA uh, and it makes it impossible for them to reproduce and therefore they can no longer be infectious. These things can be deployed very quickly and they don't leave harmful residues. So this is an ideal thing to be able to do at a high frequency basis in hospitals. However, they can't physically remove dirt and they've got a low penetrating power. So what that means is that if there's something dirt or uh, contaminant on the surface, they may not be able to get to the germs behind it. Uh, it also can't be um, something that's naturally used around people because UV light, uh, especially powerful UV light, can be harmful to skin and eyes. So additional steps are needed. So even though there is technologies and um, the, the answer of how to put them all together is, is challenging. And if you ask yourselves, what's the best approach? You know, the answer is all of them. Um, however, none of them are perfect. Uh, but when we use them in combination, uh, we have an extremely effective and a robust system. And this is really where the data comes in. What we need to be able to do is inform where uh, and what type of technologies we're using and what practices to use based on data and not just rule of thumb um, and you know, anecdotal evidence. We need real science to, make, to inform us making these decisions. And in, in coming up with the, the kind of this new practice, this new way of doing things, I've identified four areas where, uh, or you know, there's four areas where this data is needed and four steps to kind of move from the old way of doing things to the new and more advanced way to do it. Um, the first, in the first instance, what we need to be able to do is know when to clean the room. Uh, this is a, a problem because it, it, right now, most cleaning that takes place in hospitals is something that gets scheduled in advance and it doesn't take into account how often the room is used, who is using the room um, and what you know, what necessarily uh, are the risks? What does the ventilation look like? So we need to know much more about the room before we determine when and what cleaning takes place. Once we have this data, the next thing we need to do is develop bespoke cleaning procedures. This means we need to identify exactly, you know, what are the types of cleaning we're going to use and how, what does the standard operating procedures look like? And in a hospital, you know, once they're defined, they can be repeated. Uh, so this is something that does scale. Um, the third thing we need to be able to do is empirically measure the performance. So we need to actually go in with our scientific testing kits and swab surfaces before and after cleaning and figure out where are the places where we see lots of germs 
and is the cleaning uh, that we're doing addressing this? And we'd hope that over time, this is something that we can refine. So we have both uh, the person in the loop, but equally we can start to use advanced uh, data science methods. We can start using machine learning techniques and AI techniques to optimize this procedure. Um, during COVID, um, and I want to introduce a bit of a case study now. This is work that my team and I have been doing in, in our lab in, in collaboration with Acara, which is a, a startup company that I'm involved with. Um, but what we've been doing is going into hospitals and trying to put this procedure in, into action. Um, this is a radiology setting. This has been one of the settings we've been testing in. And treatment rooms like this um, needed to be disinfected thoroughly after each patient throughout COVID. And this was causing patient scanning capacity to reduce by a factor of at least four. So in the past, you know, it might be possible on a busy day to scan, you know, up to 40 patients in one of these rooms. Because of all of the additional cleaning that was needed, that was down to somewhere in the region of 10. Uh, at the worst point in the pandemic. Um, and our analysis involved sampling surfaces before and after the cleaning. Uh, what we did was we selected 12 surfaces in the room. Um, these were distributed intentionally around the whole room. Um, and what we did is we looked at high, high touch points that were likely to have high concentrations of, of these germs. Um, sampling was done using um, a method known as contact plate testing, which are effectively petri dish dishes that are filled with a nutrient agar. Um, and we place these on, on the surfaces before and after the cleaning procedure. Uh, and at that point, we effectively put the Petri dishes in, a, in an incubator or an oven where germs that you know, will, will eat the, the agar like to, to grow. And we could then examine those um, after kind of 24 to 48 hours to see you know, how many bacterial colonies or how many microbial colonies were, were, were growing on them. Um, and what we did then uh, was we, um, sorry, the, before I can continue on that, the cleaning procedure itself, um, that generally what we, we observed it happening, uh, it took place in the morning and it took in and around 25 minutes for it to, to, to happen. Now, that didn't take into account the waiting periods that are commonly incurred. That is, the, the, you know, when the, the cleaner first comes into the room to when the, the cleaner um, next leaves it. Um, and once the, the chemicals were set, you have to leave it for another 10 minutes. So typically the, the cleaning period where the room was out of action or decommissioned um, was in and around 35 to 40 minutes. Um, the surfaces that were cleaned were cleaned using a very toxic uh, disinfectant that on paper is very effective against germs, but it can be, it's known to be harmful on skin. And when I spoke to cleaners there, many of them claimed that their, their eyes uh, would, would burn um, or, or cause dizziness uh, if, if they inhaled the fumes. So this is something that isn't safe or, or well for cleaners to be doing on a high frequency base, basis. Also, cleaning can be exhausting. Uh, one of the cleaners uh, where we were we were testing, they were a Fitbit, uh, and each day they check how many steps they've made on their Fitbit, and he compared it with what uh, an eighteen-hole um, golf match would would have done for him. So he said, on a given on a normal day, it would be approximate to eighteen holes of golf. And again, this is someone in their in their mid forties, so you can imagine the toll that takes over time. Um, and also, one of the things that we, we, we observed when we did the testing, um, and you can see it in the, in the graph here, is that you know, it, it didn't give us the performance that you necessarily would expect. We saw on some days, um, so on day, um, on day two, for example, um, there was a very, very high concentration of these, these bacterial colonies, and after cleaning, it reduced. And that, that's kind of what you'd like to see. Um, unfortunately, however, that, did not, that was not averaged out across each of the days we tested on. Uh, more often than not, what happened was that where we did do, where the cleaning was done, um, you you would you know that was or where, where the surface was especially wet, you'd probably have a lot of germ reduction there. But they physically could not do the whole room in that time, and as a result, because we're sampling in such a, a diverse area, um, you know we we found that you know the the the, the places that were that were thoroughly disinfected were in the minority within the room. And as a result, we didn't actually see over a period of, of seven days of sampling, we didn't see any statistical difference in, in the presence of these germs before and after, which is extremely worrying when you consider that in a hospital there's more cleaners than there are doctors usually. Um, we were interested in alternative technologies uh, and UV was something that seemed especially uh, high potential because with UV, um, the germ killing properties are very well established. We've known that UV is effective at killing germs for over 100 years, the early research that demonstrated this, um, you know, dates back to when we saw this, you know, places where there was sun exposure uh, had, had fewer germs in them than the places that, 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 that were, were shaded. And since then, um, we've been able to, to manufacture technology that's able to emit 
light of these wavelengths. Um, so we have a, 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 a huge uh, scientific liter literature um, that demonstrates its effectiveness. So we knew we were working with a, a proven technology here. Uh, and what we did was we harnessed this technology on autonomous robots, um, the Violet robot in particular, which you can see here. Uh, this robot is, is, is manufactured by uh, a car, which is the, the spin out I mentioned earlier. Um, and what, we, what we've been able to do before we even went into the, the hospital, uh, the first kind of part was to see, OK, well, how much UV light does it take in order to kill and the kind of pathogens that we see in hospitals and cause problems? So we didn't just test against coronavirus. Uh, and what the curves show here behind me is for several different uh, microbes. So staph, uh, which is a, an infection that we see quite a lot, staph virus, pseudomonas, uh, influenza is a virus. Um, we looked at E. coli, uh, we looked at candida as well. So this is a range of virus, bacteria and fungus. And what we can see on the um, on the Y axis, this these were the um, reduction, percentage reduction in these bacterial colonies on a petri dish after we irradiate it with the UV light. Um, and what we see on the horizontal axis is the UV dose needed to achieve that level of disinfection. So what we were able to do is figure out, you know, more or less in kind of round numbers, what was the kind of UV level needed to kill most of these of these germs in a controlled lab setting. Um, we then took that and, and tried to apply it in, um, in, in the hospital setting. Um, we spent a period of time um, looking at how the robot would actually be able to move around and what will be the locations and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And um, the video here will see uh, a sample of it in action and what you're seeing here is the robot moving around uh, fully autonomously. Uh, in the beginning you can see the lights warming up um, this is just it, it takes a, a few seconds for them to reach their steady to save value so we do that before the robot moves around um, and as you can see here we tend to drive it pretty close to objects because what happens with, um, with with UV light is that the intensity of the light decays exponentially uh, the further it gets from surfaces. So it, it effectively follows uh, an inverse square law. And um, so the ideal scenario, if you want to be able to clean fast, uh, is to drive as close as you can to the surfaces that um, you, you want to irradiate. So we spent a lot of time um, iterating on where the ideal or optimal waypoints were in the room to be able to achieve this. Um, and as you can see here, it makes its way around the CT table. Of course, this would be one of the big areas where you'd expect to see high microbial content because uh, many surfaces in this are, are coming into direct content, uh, contact, I mean, with skin. And also because the patient's lying there um, when they breathe, the particles um, in the air will, will likely settle uh, close to that area. And here, the procedure we, we kind of uh, we constrained it to was was less than 10 minutes. That was the that was the scope initially. So we made sure that that was the, the key thing that we tried to refine. We wanted to be able to make the room turnaround time and uh, no more than no more than 10 minutes. So what you see here um, is obviously a sped up video, um, but from start to finish comes in at around nine minutes. Um, and what we what we did when we when we did the testing here is we measured um, at each of the 12 locations, we measured what the average UV dose was received. And we found that we were receiving in and around 13 uh, millijoules per centimeter squared. And when we compare that, we cross reference that with the values needed to kill um, various different microorganisms. We see that to, to, to achieve a 90% reduction in something like coronavirus, that's only 2.7 millijoules per centimeter squared. And when we look at, you know, even even more nasty ones like C. C. difficile, which is, um, you know, notoriously difficult to kill, that has a 90% uh, reduction at um, at a value of 9.7. So th this value uh, is, is we were quite happy with. Um, when we did the same kind of testing where we swabbed the surfaces, um, we saw a very um, much more reliable trend where you know, before had, had significantly greater um, colonies of, of these microbes uh, than afterwards, indicating that what we were doing was actually working. And um, there was one or two occasions um, where we, what the, the difference wasn't as, as noticeable. Um, and there was only one occasion where we, we detected more after than before. And while there may be numerous reasons why this be the case, it might be the case, the likelihood is, is that there was part of the room um, where the where the germs um, didn't get killed because there was some dirt or, or something on the surface that the UV light didn't penetrate. And what this indicates is that you know, as effective as UV is, it should be considered a complement to current manual cleaning practices. 
But this brings us back to where we were, you know, early on in the talk, where we need to think, what does the ideal cleaning practice look like? How can we adopt? How can we take this data and learn from it, and then, you know, apply it in in, in the most effective way possible? Um, so I'll show another video here, which kind of goes into, and, and I should mention as well in this one that we did see statistical difference, which is which is re which is really very important. Um, and the final piece uh, that I'll, I'll kind of annotate here. So this is a. The, the kind of our most recent uh, video of it in action, and this is where we involve a, a person as well. Um, effectively, what's happening here is that we send the robot around in a similar pattern, um, and we send the human cleaner in. And because our robot doesn't irradiate uh, in 360 degrees, it only irradiates a, a part of the room. It means that the cleaner can work uh, and do some cleaning while the robot's moving around and not be irradiated. Uh, by um, the, the, not be exposed to any of this UV radiation. Um, on the off chance, they do get some incidental exposure, um, just as long as the skin is covered and people are wearing a, a, a transmissible face mask like this, um, that will filter out the UV, and that's been tested. And what we've been able to do here is reduce the cleaning, uh, down, the, the human cleaning, just to a few areas in the room where we've seen this trend of, um, of, of germ buildup. Um, and as a result, this cleaning procedure can be reduced in time further. We're now looking at a period of time that's that's closer to five minutes. And it takes somewhere between 45 seconds and 90 seconds of, of human cleaning. And in fact, this can be done um, not necessarily by, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be done by a, a cleaner. The physician can actually do this as well. We've managed to get the cleaning down to such a, a small amount of time um, that it, it probably makes sense for this to be done by, by a physician. And, in this case, it would be a radiography. OK, um, so this has been the kind of key work that we've done up until this point. I wanted to close uh, by just discussing three areas where um, I think we can harness data and artificial intelligence to, to continue this trend and make further improvements. The first instance is around scheduling. Um, what we want to be able to do is move away from pre, pre, like, you know, pre-timetabled cleaning schedules and be able to actually react to what's actually happening in the room. Um, and I think we can do this by connecting smart sensors in these rooms to tell when the occupancy is and try to feed that back in. You know, we need to look at having cleaners that aren't working on, on rosters, but rather are on call, as it were, um, almost cleaning SWAT teams that respond where and when they're needed. Um, the second thing we need to be able to do is to be able to um, actually have environmental sensors that are able to tell us if something's gone wrong. Um, we, if there's, for example, carbon dioxide levels rising too high, you know, rather than having uh, allowing for something to to um, uh, rather than allowing for something to happen um, and then dealing with it retrospectively, we need to get ahead of it so that decision making can be done you know quickly. And, and that's the second piece. Uh, and finally, we need to be able to detect when cleaning's not been done. Like there's so much cleaning to be done in hospitals, it'd be very easy for a cleaner to miss something or forget to do a room. And the problem is is that it's currently because it's currently a paper based system. It's not until we collect the papers that we realize actually cleaning wasn't done on a certain time on a certain day. Like that's something that the technology currently exists to do and we need to be logging cleaning digitally immediately at the point of cleaning. And that way, um, you know, a facilities manager can know exactly when and what was done. And if something wasn't done for whatever reason, um, you know, they can get ahead of the curve. So these are three areas where our, our group are, are actively investigating. Um, and I'll close by just acknowledging the work that has been done here has, has been a team effort. Um, I'm very grateful to the partners that we've we've had, in particular um, the Midlands Regional Hospital Tullamore, who've been a clinical partner throughout, uh, as well as the HSE, who've gone a, a very who've gone out of their way on numerous occasions um, to help us, even during the worst parts of the pandemic. Uh, we're also very grateful to to Trinity College, of course, and to the Adapt Research Centre, who've been a huge support to us, uh, and SFI, who of course have funded a lot of the research that I've, I've shared here. Um, obviously, our team. Um, is, is diverse, contains engineers, uh, designers uh, and also microbiologists, uh, many of which have, have helped us on a voluntary basis. And I think the, the learnings we've had over the last year wouldn't have happened uh, without them. So we're, we're, we're thankful there as well. So at this point, I'm happy to answer questions. Super, thanks. Really amazing research, um, Dr. McGinn. Um, so really great presentation. And again, thank you for joining us in the RDI up here in South Kerry today. Um, I suppose for everyone that's in the audience, remember you can chat with Connor and do a deep dive with Connor. If there's anything in particular you wanted to go into in more detail in one of the breakout rooms that we'll be setting up from 2.45 onwards. So we'll have about 10 minutes there because Connor's got another call he has to join at three. 
Um, so keep an eye out for that, and we'll be sending the links um, with Dr. Heidi Christensen after Dr. Heidi Christensen's call. Um, but now there's an opportunity to ask any questions. So um, I suppose what we've been seeing during the talk is there's been lots of really good questions coming in. So I'm just going to use my uh, my my, uh, my phone here to read some of the questions. Um, I really would love to get one of those robots as well. I can see, uh, I can see a great use as far as in my own house with four kids. I definitely think that would be a challenge for, for Stevie. Um, I suppose one of the themes that's coming through in a lot of the questions is the whole data gathering and stuff like that around you know, GDPR issues, ethical issues and things like that. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and how you kind of do the comparison with maybe the cleaning data and how that's kind of how, how the cleaners are doing the task versus how the robots doing it? Certainly. Well, in terms of data, we were very conscious that hospitals and nursing homes and places would use this technology are sensitive environments. So while we do have sensors on the robot that can detect people and recognize faces and things of that nature, um, none of this is done on the cloud. All of the computation is on the robot and we don't save any of it. The robot's basically given an instruction not to drive into things. Um, so in that respect, you know, the data is, is processed and, and dropped straight away. So we don't save any of that information at all. Um, in terms of the cleaning that it's, it's done, when it, when it does log the information, again, you know, it's not, it's done in an anonymous way because, you know, it's, it's not, we haven't built any kind of observation on the robot. It doesn't watch cleaners yeah. or anything like that. And what we've tried to do from the beginning is engage with cleaners at every stage in the design process um, so that it kind of it reflects, it's a piece of technology that they want. The last thing we want to do is build something that's, effectively works and it's highly effective but you know the people on the front line don't feel in, involved or they don't feel empowered by it yeah. so what we've tried to do is you know from the user interfaces right down through the data collection we've tried to involve them and, and make them feel empowered to, to make decisions and you know we think that having gone through that process you know we, we've resulted in a system that um you know is, is not something that's any direct threat to anybody no, great. And it's great to hear that kind of customer driven discovery that you talked about there, because I think that answers one of the questions that Gustavo had, because he was asking, was the cleaning staff aware that that task was being evaluated and tested against the data driven approach? And I know, you know, we've we've heard a lot around in AI about human in the loop and how important it is to have humans in the loop. Um, so that obviously is what's happening with the cleaning staff, that they're, they're aware of it, you're comparing it and, and obviously you see the two working closely together, I think was your key insight there. Absolutely, yeah. and, and I guess, you know, make it very clear, um, of course the cleaners were, were involved in this, they were, uh, you know, they were research participants and yeah. they knew what the study looked at. And I observed each of these cleaning sessions and I can say with confidence that they were done very thoroughly. Um, the cleaners will tell you straight up when you speak to them that, you know, they're working an impossible job. They know that it's, it's impossible to clean every surface perfectly in, you know, they've got, They've got in many cases 10 minutes to do a job that would normally take an hour if you did it perfectly. So, you know, the, the, the issue is that, you know, and they want to get better. They have huge pride. The cleaners we've worked with, they take massive pride in the, their job and the importance they have in a hospital. Like cleaners are the backbone to hospitals. And if the cleaners do a bad job, um, then, you know, there, there's, there's significant consequences. And they know this. Um, they often feel underappreciated. And it, it, the approach we've taken is, you know, we, we appreciate them. We see that, you know, their role is, is critical. and you know, I think that you know, when you look at different sectors in society, you expect that technology would have made a difference in their in their roles. We haven't seen any change in cleaning in over 100 years. We're cleaning hospitals today the same way, you know, we cleaned hospitals during the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, so like, this isn't a threat to them. This is something that, in my view, will create new opportunities um, for a profession. It'll allow for more progression, um, you know, from entry level to higher up in, within the hospitals. Um, and it's very much on that you know, that's how, that's, that's how we enter into this. It's, it's to improve their working conditions. It's to enable them to um, get, you know, better acknowledgement for the hard work that they do. And it's to improve, um, you know, the quality of cleaning that's getting done. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, look, if COVID-19 has taught us anything, because my wife works in, in a hospital, is that the importance of the cleaning staff. So, so look, we've had some more great questions coming in. So Natalie is asking a question. What is the data with regards to the generation of the UV resistant flora by this technology? Sorry, could so, you repeat that? Um, so I'm not even, uh, so the question she's asked is, what is the data which we, that's been used with regards to the generation of the UV resistant flora by this technology? So maybe it's not clear. So the, 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 the research around um, the microbes that are developing resistance through UV is, 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 is still, you know, that's only, only coming through. We work with a, a, a microbiologist based out of the University of Plymouth, uh, Dr. Tina Joshi, who's pioneering research in this area. I'm not a microbiologist, so I can't really talk yeah. too much about it. Um, but I guess one of the, the motivations she has for this work um, is because she's, you know, told us on numerous occasions that, you know, there's growing trends now that indicate that the chemicals are, have limited effectiveness against certain microbes 
and I'd refer you to her work. Uh, yeah. There's another question coming in. You may know um, John, Fle John Fleming. He's been involved in Trinity College Dublin. So he's asking a question about short range UVC um, so people can, sit, can very safely stay in the room. He's asking about UV 222 nanometer wavelength for added safety. And he's, he sees a potential use case um, for restaurants, for example, which I know maybe not be scalable enough for what you're looking at, but have you any feedback on any of that? So, yeah, the the the, um, the wavelength of UV that we've been using on our, our systems uh, is around 254 nanometers, um, which is the kind of what's called the germicidal range. Um, there is, has been research in the last kind of I think five or six years coming out of Columbia University that indicates um, a wavelength of 222 nanometers, um, also is effective against these microbes. Uh, and what's attractive about you know UV wavelengths at uh, this level is that they, they don't penetrate deep enough to cause damage to the eyes and skin, which seemingly would make them safe in, in, in more environments. Um, I think the research is, is certainly compared to um, 254 nanometers still in its, in its early stages. Um, and there are maybe, just, I'm not sure if there's any commercially available um, 222 nanometer lamps out there to, to do the testing. We did look into it. Um, the issues, I think, largely are, are practical right now. First is we, we don't actually know um, if the science that's been proven in the lab will translate into the real world. Second is that, as I mentioned earlier, um, because the because the intensity of the UV is proportional to distance, if you install a UV light in the ceiling, um, I'm guessing the ceiling's about two and a half meters away, that will need to be exposed for a very long period of time in order to um, in order to be able to, to, to kill the micro. And also, also um, you know, you, you, when you're shining a light from the ceiling, you're often dealing with shadows. Um, so there's lots of the room that don't get exposed when you do that. So I think that, that it, it may be uh, a technology that, that comes out. I, I do think that installing it in fixtures, it, it's, again, it's, it, it's in the same way that there is benefits to it, there is clear uh, limitations of it as well. Um, and I think a lot of work needs to be done to give proof of mind, peace of mind that it's a sustainable, uh, it's a sustainable option. But, Certainly, it's emerging technology. Great. No, thanks, Colin. I think that answers the question from Sashil. If it, if it doesn't, please ask again, because he the question was, what is the harm of UVC light to the human body? So I think you've answered that. Um, the next question was around, can this technology be built into hospital theaters with the lights directed and activated as required, or is it more, or is the mobile targeted robotic approach more efficient? Um, it certainly, it could be. And actually, one of the first applications of UV lights in hospitals was in theatres as effectively upper air disinfection systems. What they did was they had UV lights that were up in the air. And at the time, uh, airborne tuberculosis was a problem and these were shown to, um, shown to reduce it. So certainly it has been something that has been implemented in the past. Again, the issue is, is that if you install it in um, on the wall or on the ceiling and there's people in the room, um, it could be challenging for you to control it in such a way that people aren't getting exposed to it. And uh, certainly in a surgical setting, you're going to have very often a lot of people in the room. So being able to target the kind of areas you want certainly benefits from you know, a mobile solution that's a little more adaptable. But again, it goes back to, I, I don't think there's one size fits all here. There's going to be you know, different times and different contexts will motivate different solutions. And I think increasingly, you know, any, any use of this technology and you know, even if it doesn't work, um, the process of, of, of treating cleaning as a data problem, um, you know, it's only going to lead to improved outcomes. Cool. No, that's great. Thanks, Connor. Um, the start of the next question I'm not happy with. He basically <laughs> says, uh, nice suit, Connor. He doesn't mention my suit at all, which is very disappointing. <laughs> but on a serious note, the question is, do you find it takes long for the doctors and physicians to get used to having violet in the room? Or is it like wearing a mask? You get used to it over time. Um, I think we're probably at, at too early a stage to, to, to definitively answer that. Um, the partners we have in Tullamore have been, from my experience, um, you know, they've been hugely open-minded and hugely willing to explore new solutions, even during the busiest times of COVID, like they made time for us and that's been a huge you know, part of the success we've enjoyed. Um, I think that from, from speaking to other hospitals, like uh, I, I think very often, like just the burnout is real. Like there's people, people are just have, they don't have enough hours in the day to get the work they want done. And something like this, any kind of innovation, they, they recognize the value in it, but you know, it's hard to make time when you don't have it to begin with. Um, so I do think that's going to be a challenge we, we face going forward, but I'm um, reassured by the conversations we've been having that, you know, there are people out there, there are organizations out there that want to champion new technologies. They, they see the future, they see robots being a big part of it. Um, and, you know, they want to, you know, be associated with, uh, with that kind of thought leadership and with that first step. So, you know, I think we'll get there. Um, it, it's just a, um, <laughs> it's just a matter, I guess, of, of knocking on enough doors. 
Yeah, I think Patricia's asking the question that we've all had in our minds, and I don't know if you're willing to share this, or it kind of goes back to my point at the very start, but it, what would what are the top line numbers on a potential unit cost for something? <laughs> so can I get it at home? I was wondering when this is going to crop up. <laughs> Um, well, look, I, I know like a, a lot of our competitors uh, that would target hospital settings, like the, the unit cost on one of these would be well in advance of 100,000 euros a year. That's um, that's 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 true. Now, you know, if, if you think about this, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you think of the cost of an infection, um, you know, in an Irish context, it probably ranges somewhere between 7,000 to, to, to 15,000, depending on what part of the hospital it is. Of course, a place like ICU's infection cost is going to be substantially higher. So, you know, if, if you're stopping 20 to 30 percent which is a conservative number based on the research then you know in a mid-level irish hospital that's probably 30 to 40 infections a year um so you know even at that even at that high high high, high number it will pay for itself pretty quickly um and unit you know, economics that we've run uh, you know in acara you know it would indicate that you know the pricing strategy we have like you know the payback period here um like for you know a monthly service cost would be you know anywhere from two to five days it's it's pretty fast and I suppose the next question is quite topical, like coming out of COVID, like we've seen a lot of change, obviously, in the hospital settings and in the last 18 months. And obviously, you know, Stevie and your work is really helping that. But like if you look forward to the kind of next five years and you look at the kind of future of healthcare, like where do you see, you know, your solution, robotic solutions coming into hospitals? Is there other applications you can see in there? Well, absolutely. I think, you know, hospitals aren't the only places that need to be to be clean better, um, like nursing homes, which was where we started out. Um, they experienced many of the same challenges. Um, and I think you know one of the reasons why we went to hospitals first is because like they have the infrastructure in place to do a lot of the testing. They're used to doing engaging in research, uh, and it would certainly be my hope that you know in not too long we'll be able to take this technology and bring it there because I, I think it can have a, a very meaningful impact. Um, you know we're looking at places like hotels and schools, and as we start to reopen, like there's many parts of society that you know we we expect and uh, we expect them to open up, and it would give huge peace of mind to know that these you know businesses are, are going above and beyond what they need to do. Um, I think we need to treat kind of infection control and, and disinfection, you know, not as kind of a box ticking exercise. I think places need to have, you know, we have an opportunity now to set very high standards in this area. So, you know, if another pandemic comes around, you know, we're, we're not going to be have to go into the same kind of lockdowns as we, we've had. Yeah. And I know you've talked about like, you know, different um, opportunities, maybe, as you said, outside of the hospital setting and the healthcare or even with maybe residents and stuff like that. But, you know, if you take Stevie kind of going forward, like, like what's the kind of roadmap in terms of, like I'm sure you had to react to COVID like in terms of picking that up, but is there other, what do you see kind of coming down the line? Is there other diseases that you're kind of built into your kind of product pipeline or in, built into your your plans? Yeah, well, I, I think there's kind of two areas where, you know, I, I think in order for the, ro the, the kind of the violent robot to work at scale, uh, there's really two things we need to do that we'll address that. The first is looking at integration. Um, like, you know, integrating a robot into or a piece of technology like this into clinical workflow is challenging because, like, you know, it's not replacing something. It's it's an it's a new introduction. Yeah. What we want to be able to do is kind of if, if this does take a bit more staff time, we need to find if we can't create that time. We need to save time somewhere else. So we're looking at elements of, of, of cleaning and, and how hospitals work that we can achieve cost savings and then reallocate the time that we save there to anything to do with the robot. And um, the second area I think it's important to look at is like, you know, a robot like Violet is, is kind of targeted primarily at surface disinfection. And of course, you know, COVID is, a, is an airborne, uh, an airborne, um, an airborne infection. So, you know, looking at how we can modify parts of that design to be, you know, more effective at specifically air uh, is definitely an area for future work. Cool. Yeah, no, no, look, I see there's, lot, there's lots of opportunity there in terms of the air quality. And outside of, like, I know at the moment your focus is very much, the case studies you mentioned are very much Ireland focused. Like, what other, what other countries would you see are geographies? Like, is there a particular target market you're going after? Is it Europe? Is there opportunities in poorer countries? How, how do you see that kind of evolving out in terms of expanding, getting off the island, as I call it? <laughs> well, well, I, I think Ireland has presented, uh, you know, we've been motivated to work here for, for a number of reasons, like, yeah. you know, not least because we live here and we care deeply about the well-being of people here, but like there really is an opportunity in Ireland to become, um, you know, an intimate, like, you know, the, the expression, I think I heard it first from, from Ken Finnegan when he talked about, um, you know, Ireland being an AI Ireland, island. I, I think there's an opportunity for it to be a robotics island. We, we have, you know, a small enough country that we can deploy technology here and, and, and demonstrate that it meets the operational requirements to scale. Um, and, you know, we're, we're English speaking, so by getting something up and running here, it translates very quickly to the UK and also to the US and also because we're in the European Union, you know, to the European Union as well. So, so our, 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 you know, we're looking at companies like MANA, 
Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the drone deliveries and like, we seem to be thinking along similar lines in some respects because, you know, if we can get it working here under, you know, objectively challenging circumstances. Um, you know, we can, we can perfect many elements of the system, almost creating a blueprint that we can scale. Um, and we're already engaged with hospitals, as I mentioned, in the UK and the US, you know, and I'd be hopeful that we'll have deployments there within, you know, the next six to 12 months. Um, questions just coming from Ian. He's asking, can AI detect when the room is infectious itself? Or is it a process in the hospitals itself? You see, it's very difficult to detect in real time the presence of germs because they're so small. Um, so there are some technologies out there that you know you can swab and it gives you an answer back immediately. Um, but you, you know there there are some issues with those instruments and we tend not to use them. Um, unfortunately, the, the the kind of the most effective process is uh, a process of you know swabbing the surfaces, which yeah. does take time. It does take expertise. It is you know long term. It's it's probably a bottleneck, and it's something that I think there's a lot of room to innovate. But ultimately, that's that's the best way to do it. And like I said, unfortunately, we can't do it. You know, you, you won't know seconds afterwards if you've done it. Generally, you've waited a day or two. Okay. Um, well, there's another question. Um, a question from John: Is there funding available for this level of innovation in hospitals for this? So. How are you, are you getting funding from I, I think, Are we turning the cameras off now? <laughs> I think anyone who, who's done research in Ireland will know that funding has been a big challenge in recent years. And yeah. like we, we've been very lucky to get funding from you know, Enterprise Ireland previously um, and, and also through SFI for, for COVID. And I think SFI did a brilliant thing at the start of COVID that they did you know, make funding available for COVID related research. And you know, we're proud to be one of the, 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 the groups that have, have benefited from that. Um, and going forward, you know, hopefully people see that there's there's opportunity here and we do have frameworks and there are European frameworks that we can apply for as well. Um, like anything, you know, oftentimes the timeframes for these things are, um, the timeframes for these things are quite long. Like, you know, in a given year, there might be three or four opportunities to get the kind of requisite level of funding you need. Um, and, you know, very often these things are highly competitive. So, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for, you know, there to be uh, five or six grants available and then you'd attract more than, you know, 100 to 200 people. So you're dealing with low probabilities, unfortunately. Um, so it is a challenge, but, you know, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, like hopefully, as I said, we talked earlier about the NDLC accelerator <laughs> your application there and hope, you know, given where we're on the regional partners, we can help you on that route. The final question for me, and, and I suppose that this is coming from a guy that, you know, is very poor at maths and stuff, but I'm all that, <laughs> like our target audience today is very much data scientists. And I'm, I'm always kind of fascinated about the AI and the pluses and minus, the numbers behind it. So could you talk to me a little bit about the, you know, how you, the algorithms and how that's kind of built out to, to get to the results that you got? Because there's a lot of secret sauce or magic that happens there. <laughs> I'd love to know a bit more about it. So kind of a, a number of different things. On the robotic side, of course, like that's a fully autonomous system. So we have, um, you know, cameras, we have special laser sensors and we have, um, you know, effectively depth cameras that looks like a camera um, insofar as you, you can, you know, see people, but rather than giving you a color value, it gives you a distance value. So we fuse those things together and we can build a you know, quite accurate map of our surroundings from that. And of course, there's a lot of, um, you know, numbers, a lot of, you know, processing there. And maybe it's going to be hard for you to go into too much detail how those algorithms work, but they're, they're, they're established. They're, this, is, this is typically referred to as SLAM. Um, once we have the map, um, the process of getting it to navigate the room. Um, right now, it's being like largely done through trial and error based on the, the data we have, but we do have designs um, to do a lot of this in simulation over time. So once we have you know done enough manual trial and error, we'll hopefully be able to embed heuristics that will allow you know reinforcement al reinforcement learning algorithms to, to run. So you know given a typical shape of a room, um, and you know we can semantically label parts of that room. Um, you know we can we can translate knowledge that we picked up from our, our kind of our swab testing into you know coming up with you know autonomously um, and automatically uh, you know optimal routes for these things um looking into the the, the microbial analysis component um obviously you know we're, we're we're dealing with big data sets there of of, of you know colonies of of, of Normally it's bacteria, but sometimes there's fungus too. Um, you know, the process of analyzing that involves a lot of statistics, uh, a lot of hypothesis testing. Um, again, you're dealing with very often non-parametric data, which can be messy. And um, so, you know, it, it, there's obviously a lot of data science on that end as well. Good. Um, and one thing I'll just finish on, because I, I think everyone's aware this is a blended event, right, which is quite unique. So we have people here in the audience in the RDI Hub. So if anybody has a question, uh, and I'll repeat it, maybe Leopoldo, I don't know if you have a particular question on anything you heard. This morning, that you want um, to ask um, Connor? Uh, not or, really. I mean, they're, they're 
great, great research there. So uh, uh, I think uh, everything was covered with the questions from the audience, but good, good job there. Thanks. OK, Thanks. cool. So look, um, Connor, thanks a million again. It was a really fascinating piece of research. Um, I think it was a great story, great uh, keynote to start our, our John McCarthy I summer school because it's so topical at the moment, you know, coming out of COVID and disinfections and wellness and stuff like that. So really, really a uh, big thank you again for your participation. Uh, oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Absolute right. pleasure. And hopefully uh, there'll be some interest in the breakout room later. Great. Thanks a minute. Uh, Great. Good call out for the breakout room. Well. <laughs> okay. um, so now I'd like to bring uh, Ken Finnegan. Um, uh, AA Ireland, I think, is uh, what um, uh, Connor called him earlier on, but uh, he's the Chief Executive Officer at, at Tangent, uh, Trinity's Idea Workspace, uh, to the stage, uh, who will facilitate the QA with our next speaker, uh, Dr. Heidi Christensen from the University of Sheffield. Uh, so, Ken, uh, welcome to the RDI Hub. I know this is a, unusually, this is only your second visit here. Like I think when you came for the launch in February last year, I think we thought you'd be coming down every quarter and then this uh, this COVID inconvenience happened and we, we haven't seen you since, but it's great to have you back. Uh, lovely to have you here. Uh, thanks as well for uh, Tangent becoming a key partner in this year's John McCarthy AI Summer School. Um, and I suppose to start with, uh, can you tell, can you talk to people a little bit about Tangent? And I know you're going to have two of our speakers tomorrow have been very involved in Tangent in recent times. With your AI accelerator and your uh, your launch box, so I'll hand over to you, Ken. Um, thanks very much, Liam. A pleasure to be here. So yeah, so Tangent is Trinity's Ideas Workspace. In Tangent, we aim to bridge the gap between the university and the wider startup ecosystem. So we collaborate with companies, large and small, who play an active role and um, working with our startups, our students, and on their own professional development and um, programs. Um, that Tangent um, offer. So. Uh, Tangent is Trinity's Ideas Workspace. We provide access to a variety of mentorship programs inspiring the next generation of learners, entrepreneurs and startups who will all provide meaningful impact in the world. Um, it's also home to Launchbox Trinity Student Accelerator, which only finished up last fri Friday, actually. And our most recent accelerator, which is the AI Accelerator at Alcesor, and um, we run in partnership with Altada, one of the most successful um, uh, SMEs in Ireland at the moment in artificial intelligence. 2021 was the inaugural year for the AI Accelerator. After five months of honing their startup, six finalists completed are com um, competed to secure a quarter of a million in funding, and um, courtesy of Oyster Haven Ventures and Rock Top Partners. This year, um, this year's AI Accelerator winner in Peel and actually Field of Vision, the runners up will present here at the school tomorrow. So we're excited to see them tomorrow. Um, and just for any startup interested in, interested in participating on our accelerator, Alcessor, we will begin to accept applications for the accelerator starting about mid-October. So if you're an AI startup with a great idea, don't hesitate to get in touch. Yeah, Ken, I'm probably going to take you back a little bit to before your tangent days, back to maybe what uh, Connor was talking about earlier on, because I know when you were in the IDA, you were driving a lot of stuff, uh, strategy around AI, and as Connor was saying, you know, making an AI Ireland or whatever like that. Yeah. How have you how have you seen developments in recent times? Like I know there was a recent strategy document that came out around AI for good. Um, how, how do you see the developments that are happening in recent times around AI on the island? You know what, it's been an amazing journey actually. So previous to my role in Trinity, I was in uh, chief technologist in IDA Ireland, and um, I was given the, the 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 order, if you want, or the opportunity to develop kind of like the proposition, a national proposition around artificial intelligence for Ireland. Um, that began around 2015, 2016, I think. And I remember when Leo Clancy, who's the head of um, Enterprise Ireland, he was my boss in IDA at the time, had come to me with the idea of kind of like looking into artificial intelligence. What sprung to my mind was the robots are coming, kind of like the, the Terminator 2 type things. Um, but we pulled together kind of like a group of 100 people that represented um, SMEs, multinationals, um, academics. We had the unions present, we had um, government agencies present, and the whole idea was to kind of like um, have a look at what is Ireland's proposition around artificial intelligence. So that was a seed of kind of like understanding what the future might look like for Ireland. So that was where AI Ireland and the concept of AI Ireland came from as well. And subsequent to that, then it's been a journey to get to, I guess, the re most recent highlight from a national perspective is the national strategy that was launched by um, Minister Troy um, at the beginning of the summer in, in Tangent. Um, so we're really proud to be to have been involved in that. But it's also from from inception, if you want, to where we are now. I think Ireland as a country, we're in a really, really strong position like foreign direct investment, technology companies and technical capability have been here for quite a long time now. So we're not starting from a kind of like a blank um, sheet. We're starting in a very kind of like um, 
enviable position if you want to compare it to a lot, a lot of other country, uh, countries. No, I couldn't agree more. And look, Ken, I think reading the, the recent strategy document is just it's a testament to where things have come and the vision that you had, you know, when you were in the idea to bring it forward with Leo Clancy. So well done. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Ken, uh, to intro, intro our next speaker, uh, which again has a hot, has a tough act to follow after Conor again, but I'm sure you'll do well. Very good, thank you. So everybody, you're in for a treat with our next speaker. Dr. Heidi Christensen is a senior lecturer in computer science at the University of Sheffield, a member of the Centre for Assistive Technology and Connected Healthcare Catch at the University of Sheffield. Dr. Heidi Christensen is part of the Speech and Hearing Research Group, SPNH, and a theme lead with the UKRI Centre for Doctoral Training in Speech and Language Technologies and their applications. She is also the technical lead for Cognospeak, a speech-based tool for detecting and tracking early signs of cognitive impairment. She joins us today from Sheffield to talk about how speech signal technology can be used to advance healthcare. Heidi, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so I've just been guided through how to share my presentation in the um, So let's hope this, this works. I probably need a little bit of feedback whether everyone can see this now and hear me, of course. OK, I'll assume I'll be told if you can't. So thank you so much for inviting me here um, and give me an opportunity to talk to you and, and talk to you about what is uh, really close to my heart, how we can use speech technology to kind of advance um, healthcare. So uh, as uh, you heard there, I'm working at the University of Sheffield. I'm originally from Denmark, but I've been there for 20 something years. Um, this is a PDF of my very carefully crafted uh, keynote presentation, but apparently that doesn't really work with um, Microsoft. Um, but let's hope uh, it's not too kind of distorted. So I wanted to first um, talk you through sort of um, general healthcare applications of uh, speech technology. Um, so you probably know the uh, very distinguished professor on the right here, um, Professor Hawkins, um, who was a very, very um, keen and um, um, adamant kind of user of speech technology in general. So the types of speech technology we talk about uh, is uh, mainly speech recognition. So that's taking speech and turning it into text. Um, speech synthesis, so that's kind of going the opposite way, which Professor Hawkins, of course, used, made use of for a long time of his uh, life. He got very devoted to his voice, and although technology moved on from this uh, very distinct sort of robotic voice, he was insistent that he keep that because it kind of um, was part of his personality by then. Uh, and then a speech analysis, so in general sort of measuring aspects of speech, for example, um, how well you pronounce something or um, signs of dementia, which is something I work on. And then a speech processing in general, so altering the speech signal in uh, many, many different ways. But for example, in kind of working with um, speech pathologies, um, you might be interested in trying to make, make speech more intelligible. So all of these different um, types of applications, if you like, um, involve different aspects of IA um, in all the different ways that we kind of can define AI. So both in the way of trying to give machines more human like capabilities and um, making it understand speech, making it talk. Um, but also, of course, in terms of machine learning, uh, learning general patterns through data. Um, so. Uh, my keen interest or key interest is in pathological speech and in particular in how we can use technology to improve the lives of people with pathological speech. So what do we mean by this? Um, generally, um, when people have communication order, uh, your normal or typical speech uh, is disrupted. So this can be caused by a number of different conditions, for example, cerebral palsy, stroke or um, cognitive impairment. I'll talk you through some of these in a bit. So how can automation uh, and AI in general kind of contributes uh, in this sort of space. Often when we've got AI um, power tools, uh, it makes things faster, cheaper, uh, more repeatable and more objective. So these are some of the reasons why we might go down um, the line of trying to apply AI. Um, computers can complement the analysis that humans might do in routine care, um, clinicians and health practitioners in general. And we can kind of see automation as a way of augmenting healthcare provision, um, which can mean, for example, increased access to data points outside of face to face meetings. So um, often when we start talking to clinicians about what the options are, um, there is a misconception that we're trying to replace them. 
and very, very rarely is that the case. Instead, we are trying to perhaps free up some of that time to be spent uh, on the more kind of useful, um, high quality, if you like, uh, interactions they have with patients uh, and then provide them with sort of uh, additional information along the way. So I just wanted to think a little bit about the impacts on quality of life that speech technology in general can kind of bring. So I've just outlined in the rows here the different um, sort of broad types of conditions that I've worked with. Um, of course, there are many, many more. So something like cerebral palsy um, is a good example of a kind of lifelong uh, condition. You have it from birth, normally from complications uh, during birth. Um, so it's for life. Um, and somehow it becomes normal for that person and the family. Uh, but in terms of impact on quality of life, um, the impact is huge and sustained um, in general. Um, something like stroke or um, traumatic brain injury from, uh, for example, an accident. Um, the duration can be anything from a few weeks to for life. Um, and it's normally a very abrupt um, vocation, of course. Uh, with not many signs leading up to it. Um, so you might go from one day lead, leading a very active and working um, life and then suddenly be um, severely impaired. And there's a lot of um, a long process of kind of rehabilitation afterwards. So the impact on your quality of life, uh, of course, is huge. Um, a lot of change and a lot of um, things to deal with very suddenly, uh, but also with some hope of improvement with time. And contrast that eventually or finally with uh, dementia or um, ALS, for example, or other neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's. So here we are thinking about um, it's a very slow onset late on in life, typically. Um, and the rate of uh, degeneration kind of varies. Um, but most of these are fatal and chronic kind of uh, conditions. And there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty connected with this and this sort of sense once you have the diagnosis that things will get worse. So for that group of people, it's really important that we um, help them and their families to perhaps get diagnosis um, early without too much anxiety and waiting and then being able to give them the right support throughout. Um, so think a little bit about how speech technology might make a difference. And this is a, a, a totally non-complete list of things that we um, can do or hoping to be able to do. Um, the sort of obvious starting point, I think, is dictation. So even just 10 years ago, um, even for people with typical speech, it was not uh, possible to really have good dictation systems. So they were a bit clunky, but these days, of course, we're all able to dictate emails, etc., and messages on our phones. It's widely available. So it's sort of, in some senses, sorted or solved for typical speech. But of course, for pathological speech, we are way behind. Um, and that for uh, a lot of these people, for example, people with cerebral palsy would make a huge change if they were able to dictate, for example, an email or um, documents in general. Communication aids um, is also really important, especially if you have um, severe cerebral palsy with a sort of severe speech impairment. Um, and in general, spoken language interfaces that we're now becoming so used to on your phones, in your homes, uh, various smart speakers, people speak to their cars. That's all becoming um, totally pervasive um, for most of us. Um, in terms of therapy and rehabilitation, there's also a lot of need for speech technology to kind of automate and um, give really objective um, kind of evaluations. And then in general, there's a kind of intelligibility um, assessment that is also really useful. So people are working on all of these areas and I have to say probably along the lines of where um, typical speech Technology now is moving into um, the big companies, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. Um, more and more people in the sort of um, academic world are interested in these more niche areas, for example, with pathological speech. So that's just really exciting time for us. So I want to talk about just two things really in, in this talk, which are the two main areas of uh, research I'm involved with. So how we can improve communication ability for people with atypical speech and the kind of core building block there is speech recognition. And then how we can detect signs of pathology in a person's speech and language in general. So in terms of improving communication ability, um, the core motivation here is that people with atypical or dysarthric speech um, caused by long term conditions like cerebral palsy or brain injury or stroke find it hard to communicate effectively with other humans and with machines. Um, so there's kind of a double whammy. So their close family uh, will understand them 
uh, and care us, but in generally they can be quite difficult for other people to understand. And certainly this carries over into machines that are kind of trained to recognize human, uh, sorry, um, typical speech. Um, so they can't use current um, speech technology. And in addition to that, they very often have mobility problems. Um, so they struggle to use other ways of communicating, for example, with machines, so keyboards and mouse and trackpad and all of those uh, other things. Um, so if we were able to give them a speech enabled interface, uh, the impact really would be for life. And um, some examples down here for kind of applications that um, use speech recognition. Uh, and I've thought, worked of, on all of those. Now this here um, is a video, <laughs> which unfortunately I'm not able to play to you, um, but this is a guy uh, called John Toogood. So he's um, a kind of gold star user in our catch center. And um, we've worked with him for probably 15 years, if not longer. Um, he's donated a lot of speech, but he's also been absolutely crucial as a co-designer on the projects. We've worked with him a lot. Um, he's got moderate to severe um, dysarthria. Um, and what I normally do is play him um, talking a little bit about this communication aid that you see here. Um, and the first time I played the video, I played with a sort of um, a line across the captioning. So it's a bit like watching a film in a foreign language and you're just really struggling to quite cue into what's been said. And then I play it again without uh, with the captioning and you then realize that it's not like he's not saying all of the words. He is. Uh, saying everything grammatically and, and like um, anyone would say. So it's not a language production problem, but it's purely a speech production problem. Um, and you kind of, as you can read the words at the same time, you could kind of cue in. So it's those little extra cues that help your brain to kind of perceive what it is John is saying. Uh, it's a bit like if I'm watching a French film, for example, if the captioning is on, um, I'm just a little bit um, better at, at my French. So, um, what are the challenges of recognizing dysarthric speech? Why is it that this is actually um, very difficult, um, given we've sort of come such a long, a long way with uh, speech technology for typical speech? So um, I assume uh, quite a lot of you are not familiar with um, speech recognition. So this is a one page um, crash course in automatic speech recognition. And the reason I'm showing the slightly complicated diagram is just for you to um, be able to kind of see um, what parts of an automatic speech recognizer might struggle when um, it is exposed to speech which is not sounding like typical speech. So on the left here you've got a person speaking and uh, we then have an acoustic front end that is processing various uh, typical kind of uh, speech processing or signal processing algorithm here to reduce a bit of noise etc. And then we extract features and the feature here means uh, key bits of information and that's sort of honed down. So even for people with dysarthria, you would probably um, extract more or less the same information as you do for uh, people with typical speech. Um, and those features are then passed onto the decoder, the kind of search algorithm. Uh, and that search algorithm in sort of uh, classical automatic speech recognition systems use make mainly use of three models, as you can see the red arrows here. So the acoustic model telling you a little bit about the phonemes and the kind of um, sounding blocks of speech. A language model that tells you a sort of probabilistic model telling you um, the sort of likelihoods of particular words appearing after uh, other words. And then a pronunciation model at the sort of word level telling you what um, sounds are more likely to uh, appear after each other for particular words. And um, all of these are kind of specific to the language, but normally for typical speech, you could record perhaps um, a thousand hours or hundred thousand hours like Google might do and put all of that speech together and train really, really powerful models. But for dysarthric speech, um, sometimes that's not possible because they each sound very, very different. And so you're ending up having very, very small amounts of data to train this with. And I should say that this is a sort of traditional speech recognizer. Um, the modern ones, as you might have guessed, is kind of going down the route of uh, deep learning. Um, and what really happens is that you might start with the speech in on the left side and then everything else is a big deep learning uh, model. Um, those are currently the sort of strongest models, really, um, but they take a lot of data. And of course, when we're working on pathological speech, we just don't have anywhere near that amount of data. So we're stuck with this kind of model 
and will be for some time. But it also gives you opportunities to tune each of these. You can imagine if you have a particular speaker who uh, are struggling with particular vowels, for example, you might be able to tune the acoustic model to take this into account. So that was a crash course uh, in um, automatic speech recognition or ASR, as we say. So I just wanted to talk you through a little bit about what we then see in this disastrous speech compared to typical speech. Um, and on the right here, don't worry too much if you can't um, read the labels and, and everything, but basically you've got disastric uh, speech at the top and non disastric speech at the bottom. And the thing to look at is each ring is a kind of distribution, if you like, in frequencies of different vowels. And the rings at the top are much broader than at the bottom. At the bottom, they are sort of spread out a little bit. They don't overlap too much, but at the top, there is a lot of overlap. And that is basically indicating a, a sort of lack of consistency in the way people are able to use their articulators. So everything sounds a little bit the same and they're not able to make um, the different phonemes or the different building blocks of sound distinct enough. And that makes it really hard for human ears to hear and it makes it really hard for um, computer ears to, to really uh, make sense of. Um, however, the last bullet point here is a really important point. So people with moderate to severe uh, disastrous speech are understood by close friends and family. So for example, uh, John that you didn't see on the video, but just saw a picture of, um, his carers, when I go to visit him and his family, uh, will understand him more or less 100%. Um, and so what's interesting about that is that it gives us um, hope um, from the kind of machine learning perspective that these variations are not random at all. Um, they're produced by this physical system of uh, articulators moving a little bit differently than people without impairments. Um, but there is information in there that can be learned by the human brain, so we should think that we could also learn this by uh, computers, uh, which is good news. So to summarise our kind of main research challenges are to do with data. So when I say they've got 100,000 hours or something in Google, uh, that's not an underestimation. So they really have, um, every time you use your phone, uh, they will collect that data and add into their model. Um, but in my world, we've got maybe 20 minutes from one person or a little bit more. Um, so a lot of the work really is about how we can build a well-performing speech recognizer from these very, very sparse data sets. So for each individual, uh, it's really, retire really tiring to record many hours of speech. And so it, that makes it impossible. I can't say to, for example, John, um, you know, over the next three weeks, can you record 100 hours for me? Uh, that's just not possible. It's, it's a sort of whole body thing for him to record or speak. It's also difficult to get transcriptions. Uh, which means having a text file of uh, basically saying which words were said in this bit of audio. Um, and that's really important in terms of AI machine learning because we train with a sort of parallel corpus of the audio and then um, lists of which words were said. Normally, if I went to record 100 hours from someone, I could give it to some students in my lab and say, you know, listen to this, I'll pay you some money and write down what's been said. That's not possible with someone like John because everyone's struggling to really understand what he's saying, except if you ask, for example, his um, family to help us transcribe. And of course, in the long run, that's that's not feasible. So it makes it just harder to get going on the research. And also, um, there's hardly any found data. So for the sort of main uh, stream speech recognition um, work, there's a lot of work on kind of um, information from databases and TV, etc. We haven't got that. And also we need to personalize. So um, the speaker independent models do not uh, generally work well. So we really need something that uh, is specific to that person. I'm just going to speed up a little bit because I can see we uh, did a little bit of um, faffling about in the beginning. So this graph here um, shows you the involvement or the development from 1970 for mainstream ASR, the very basic systems, command and control, detection systems, personal assistance and kind of interactional systems now with robots and virtual agents. And this is where disastric ASR is, so way, way back, um, you know, back when I was just born. Um, so we really have a lot of work to do. So how far have we come? What else uh, general work? Um, kind of focused on. I'm going to go through this. So if you're not very familiar with speech tech, hopefully you will understand some of the higher kind of level. So one of the things people have done is trying to um, do model adaptation, taking these typical uh, speech models and try and morph them in or adapt them onto something which is a bit more suitable for disaster models 
all of the models we saw went up in the slide. Um, there's also been a lot of work of trying to increase the amount of data using general sort of schemes for this, trying to use out of domain data, trying to pool it with typical data, try to do data augmentation to try and permeate um, the data we have. And then there's been work sort of doing the opposite, almost taking the disastrous speech and trying to make it sound a bit more or appear a bit more like typical speech in the hope that we then might be able to use these uh, really powerful typical speech um, ASR engines. And there's also been a lot of work to try and find better encodings. Perhaps we could use articulatory data in supplement to the acoustic data to try and get a better sort of higher dimensional um, angle to, um, or, um, to the kind of speech signal. Um, that was an idea we kind of visited probably 20 years ago in, in, in mainstream ASR. It didn't really work because we ended up having so much data, um, but there is a hope that this might be a way of, of um, working with disaster speech. And people are also investigating using video as a, having a multimodal ASR system because there's a lot of information by watching a person's kind of um, the way they move their mouth and head. And in general, kind of using some tricks uh, here, so you may or may not be familiar with some of these um, approaches here by IBEX and speed invariant kind of features. And of course, recently we have tried as best we can to move into deep learning, um, starting with some of the less data hungry kind of approaches and sort of all the while sort of revisiting all of the above, if you like. So we have a long line line of Sheffield work here. I didn't want to kind of um, give you too many slides with all of the work, but just kind of want to mention a few key things. So home service is an early work. Um, probably 10 years ago, I worked on this where we put systems in people's homes and tried to record data. And these were just recognizing one single word, but it worked remarkably well once you have a lot of data from one person. We've done some work on using articulators. Again, things work well, but we need more data. Transforming uh, of the speech that also works to some extent. We have to be quite difficult not to break things, if you like, in the modeling. And then recently we've worked a little bit on emotion recognition to try and see if people with dysarthric speech can express emotions and um, they can. So that's good, uh, good news. There's a lot of commercial interest now. So Google um, are collecting speech um, just this week. We have a big in um, speech tech conference and they have a paper tomorrow actually on 100 million um, utterances um, or words, I think it is actually, but um, they're not releasing the data. So this is kind of staying within Google and other companies voice. I, it's and uh, therapy box are working on this. So let me move on to the other half of the talk, uh, which is on detecting signs of pathology in a person's speech and language. So this is something I've started working on in the last five years, I would say. Um, as we get all, of course, um, dementia, um, is an um, increasing kind of uh, risk and uh, it's a sort of cognitive impairment which is the result of various conditions, for example, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. Um, and people often show very early signs of the condition in their speech and language, which are too subtle sometimes to be picked up by people uh, in their um, kind of families and, and carers, etc., but may uh, be able to be picked up by automatic um, speech recognition algorithms. Um, so famous examples where people have looked at how people's language change over time. For example, Iris Murdoch, the famous um, British author. Um, people compare the speech or the language in her books and found towards the end that it was much empowered. And the same with Ronald Reagan, um, where um, his speeches are kind of press conferences people looked at. And of course, he was um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I think five years after he left office. So the current diagnostic processes are basically pen and paper. So there's this mocker test, for example, where people kind of look at different things. It's a very simple test in some ways. This is the test that uh, Donald Trump famously chopped um, or aced, I think he called it. Um, so all of it's very straightforward unless you've got cognitive impairment, then you start kind of worrying or showing signs. Uh, in general, we're interested in detecting dementia because um, there are currently a lot of people going to see the doctor with memory concerns and the, the GPs are not very good at actually accurately um, 
finding out whether they should be referred to secondary care for further invest, uh, investigation or not. So at the moment, lots of people get referred just to be on the safe side, and these are very, very expensive assessments. So what we're really hoping is to give the GPs this tool that can better help them make that decision, because lots of people have problems with their memory, but not all of it is to do with um, dementia. So it's better if they could be seen early. So we looked at uh, analysing people's conversational abilities. First, just recording um, patients speaking to doctors and see what came out there, but eventually making a digital doctor like the one I've got on my right here uh, on the table that are asking people some memory probing um, questions. And we're then using AI to kind of try and look for um, particular patterns in the way people answer these questions, uh, hesitations, choice of words, empty phrases, lots and lots and lots of things we're extracting and then using uh, various classification algorithms to try and, and uh, unpick what's going on. Um, so this is an animation as well, but obviously not on a PDF. So what we're kind of doing is analysing conversations between the patients and this computerised head and basically just making this decision between um, low, intermediate or high risk of dementia. And so that's what the GP can kind of use to, to decide whether they should refer to secondary care or they should um, provide different types of care for, um, for the patient. And um, of course, when you have systems like this, um, you have to be really, really careful with um, the errors that you're making. So um, we want to prevent lots of people going to the secondary care for expensive analysis if they don't need to. But what's even more important is, of course, to avoid anyone being um, misclassified as being low risk of dementia when really they are at risk. So we're trying with the machine learning to really um, move this sort of decision boundary to avoid those kind of um, false negative um, classes. And I wanted to just go through a few other things that is happening in Sheffield related to this. So we've done a lot of work on automatic ways of analysing picture descriptions. So the picture here on the right is, a, is an example of a very classic picture that you give to people. Um, it is totally politically incorrect these days. Uh, I do a lot of work in kind of equality work and uh, I'm, I'm not happy with it. But anyway, it is what it is. But it's a very 50s sort of paper, isn't it? Picture. And the idea is that um, when people start describing this, if they have cognitive impairment, they may fail, for example, to recognise that the children are probably the children of, uh, of the woman and the woman is their mum. And sometimes they might not notice, for example, that there's a bit of a disaster with the tap and the sink. So those kind of things that so they will kind of jump around and, and um, perhaps talk about the lady rather than the mum. So those kind of subtle things, when you've got a hundred um, or more description, you can kind of start seeing how the language um, changes and also how they kind of jump around in terms of the topics they cover. Other things we've worked on is uh, stroke survivors, again, to try and give um, automatic ways of monitoring cognitive impairment. Of course, once you've had a stroke, there's a lot of um, rehabilitation and further assessment. You spend a lot of time in and out of hospitals. So if you could be at home and do some of the assessment on these kind of automatic tools, this would be really nice. And similarly, we work with patients with mild cognitive impairment, which can be a pre uh, stage to dementia and uh, we sort of monitor whether they convert, as it's called, to Alzheimer's disease uh, and a couple of other things that we're kind of working with. I'll skip all this in the interest of time. Um, so currently we're working with a company called TherapyBox to um, commercialise Cognitive Speak, which is taking all of the kind of speech analytics and the machine learning and, and with a nice front end to put this tool um, in the hands of GPs to really start collecting even more data. And now I wanted to finish with an additional kind of item, having covered the kind of uh, my kind of uh, research topics here, but just uh, thinking a little bit about the main challenges for working with healthcare applications uh, and, and sort of AI. Um, so there's many, many um, things to consider. Um, and as you will probably have taken from the speech so far, talk so far, um, one of the key things as a researcher is this kind of difficulty around having access to sufficient and um, sufficiently good speech materials. So the data sets are small and often they're collected uh, with particular ethics, certainly in the UK here, it's very difficult to be allowed to collect data from patients and then also be allowed to share it, as it should be, of course. Uh, but what that means is that you end up with these researchers across the globe 
they each have a small data set, but there's no way of um, pooling all of this together. And of course, for AI and kind of machine learning, that's kind of key for us to upgrade our models, if you like, into something that's a bit more um, state of the art. Um, the data that we have got access to, to have not necessarily been recorded for speech recognition, if that's what I'm interested in. So, for example, in the um, world of disordered speech, there are a couple of data sets that are tiny, but also they were recorded for slightly different things. And it, it means it's just uh, there's some peculiarities with the data that just makes it a little bit different in terms of the AI and, and the kind of machine learning to be careful not to um, or to sort of build in a little bit of, of uh, bias in there. Um, also, if you're kind of recording data, um, it can be very messy. So I'm very, very fortunate to work with a neurologist in a local hospital just down the road, really, from campus in, in Sheffield. Um, and he's been really helpful in kind of um, recruiting uh, patients and, and getting them through this. But ever so often, he will kind of uh, update various cells in, in, in our kind of shared spreadsheet with uh, diagnostic categories because for him, diagnosing dementia is is not it's not um, it's quite a grey area, and and so things uh, labels change, and uh, that's a little bit um, annoying if you're doing machine learning because you then need to retrain your models. Uh, but that's just how it is. And of course, we want to have the best um, quality uh, category. So we we really welcome um, that the labels get improved, if you like. Um, and then a lot of the data sets are, are basically lacking a lot of standardized setups, which um, probably if you have a speech tech um, hat on is, is of more interest here. Um, and, and there's a little bit less good practice around sort of making scripts available and having everything um, open source. And then I say also when working sort of healthcare applications coming from an engineering and kind of computer science background, um, it's really important that you bear in mind that you are developing this for people. Um, it has to be useful and it has to be usable to your uh, user groups. Um, and you've got different types of end users, carers, clinicians, um, patients themselves or people with memory concerns themselves. Um, so do a lot of co-design workshops if you can. Uh, try and take on board early ideas and projects uh, and take them to PPI groups to get patient and public kind of involvement early on. We've learned a lot. Um, you really cannot assume anything and, and through that sort of do repeated kind of evaluations. And then so my final slide here in terms of top tips, um, work closely with clinicians if at all possible, if you are coming from an engineering and computer science background. Um, it's great fun um, and try and embrace the sort of multidisciplinary aspects of projects. Um, that is super challenging, but also for me, certainly uh, really, really rewarding. Everyone coming from the different cultures in terms of research background and really trying to find a, a common language. And in that sort of area, be careful with your own language. Um, when I'm reviewing other people's paper, I, I, I try and really put this down. But for example, we're using word like normal. We should be using the word typical for typical speech, for example. Be careful using the word patient if people are not in a hospital kind of setting, talking about people suffering from, etc. Um, but these are all things for us to kind of learn along the way. And most of all, sort of enjoy and um, yes, um, throw yourself out in it. So this is just um, hopefully a complete list of, of my collaborators, students, etc. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and navigate back to um, Teamworks here. Thank you, Dr. Christensen, for a great presentation. I think um, um, like part of the, 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 the whole program for the summer school is to demonstrate um, wellness and multiple different applications with regards to AI. And, and the work you're doing here is, is incredible in terms of a very specific cohort of individuals. So well done and thank you for a great presentation. Um, we're now going to take some questions from the audience. So if anybody has questions, please pop them into the chat. I have some lined up already. So without further ado, um, Liam asks, Dr. Christensen, what are the ethical issues you have to overcome when gathering speech data? That's a very good question. Do do just call me Heidi. Um, yeah, so, so um, it's very, very interesting uh, because, of course, with speech data, um, you are totally identifiable. If someone's heard you talk before, um, they can identify you and that that is a big issue, but it's somehow seen as less intrusive than if we were to uh, record videos. So people, for example, would be happier to have audio recordings in their home rather than video recordings. Um, secondly, of course, you have to be really careful when 
uh, with what you are asking them about. So one of the things we are interested in is to what degree can people remember, for example, um, what did you do over the weekend or what did you do when you left school? And of course, um, there will be personal information in there. So we try and take some of this out, but at the same time, if you are wanting to have high quality labels of what people said, you can't anonymize everything because it doesn't fit with the audio. So there is um, a lot of work there. So we, we do not tend to share any of the data we record, for example, with our Cognospeak system um, for, for those particular reasons, yeah. Very good. Um, we have a question in from Claire. How do you remove the noise or bad data gathered with the speech data gathered? Yeah, um, I would say actually removing background noise is less of a problem these days. Even with a sort of simple laptop, you can get an OK uh, speech to noise ratio, as we call it. Um, I'm on a different project working with people who found some cassette tapes of uh, mums talking about their twins um, probably about 15 years ago. That's noisy and, and that is difficult to kind of work with. But modern technology, I'd say you have a pretty good um, way of doing. There's still work you can do. Um, in terms of speech, in general speech recognition, the, the biggest noise is often from other speakers. So, for example, if you're in general working with conversational data, people um, with overlapping speech, um, that's that's difficult to handle. Um, and so we see that a lot with, uh, for example, our conversations, you might bring in your spouse uh, and they will kind of, as couples do, they've known each other for 40 years, talk on top of each other all the time. So that's tricky in terms of the AI. And uh, like, are there any applications that you'd recommend or are there any kind of like methods that you recommend above others for, for recording? Yeah, so so of course we, we would have a lot of kind of in-house methodologies and approaches, but there are um, in various kind of recording tools like Audacity, they might know that there are kind of um, noise reduction um, algorithms in there you can use. You sort of get the tool to look at a section without speech and just look at what the background noise is and they will try and subtract it in a sort of signal processing way. Okay, excellent. Um, Rating um, has asked, are you focusing on adults for research or um, children or children included in the, uh, the research and the data? Um, I haven't worked with children, uh, uh, but I would love to. So for example, on the kind of communication aids in terms of um, um, people with cerebral palsy, of course, it's for life. And really, I think they should be given a communication aid, you know, very, very early on so they can start communicating straight away. Um, Going back to previous questions, that's where often ethics is kind of a little bit problematic because you um, getting access to children, being allowed to record enough data from them can be difficult, but yeah. Um, there is there's a wonderful company called Soapbox Labs here uh, based in Ireland that are getting um, global recognition around children's speech and children's learning. Maybe we can connect to and with those guys as well. For Yes, I have. Uh, yeah, I think I have a colleague who's gone there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> shared learning. OK, very good. Um, Jen asks, do you have a sense of the financial benefits for the NHS or the HSE um, of your tools by reducing the referrals for um, people presenting with memory issues? Yeah, um, we did just um, get a big grant um, where we all, all apply for big grants, so we have to kind of estimate that. So I think potentially there are millions to be saved by the NHS um, because it's such a bottleneck. Obviously, it's a long process. You have to kind of demonstrate the accuracy of what you're doing. Um, but these kind of expensive uh, assessments, the scans and, and uh, blood tests, and et cetera, um, they kind of add up. And of course, clinicians time, so neurologists are not cheap. Um, so the more we can um, channel their kind of time into looking at the right patients, the better for everyone. And just, uh, just as a curiosity, can you tell me, um, like in terms of percentage of the population um, that would be impacted by um, speech um, challenges or issues, like what would what would that look like? Yeah, so I didn't actually mention that. So something like dementia, um, I think it's 850,000 in the UK. So it is actually the biggest killer in uh, England and Wales. So I don't know for Ireland or the rest of the world, but it is an increasing problem because we live longer. Um, so it's bigger than heart disease or cancer or those kind of major things. It receives a lot less funding. Um, and, and one of the issues at the moment is that there, there's a lot of research going into trying to find treatment, as you can imagine, but it's, um, you know, there's very little you can actually do. But once you have that, of course, there's a lot of interest in trying to detect people early. And it's not it. It's kind of like it's like um, we're we're living longer, but not the quality. Our quality of life um, isn't necessarily um, um, matching that the, the longevity of our life. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I have a question in from Liam. How do you gather emotional um, recognition data from humans? Ah, that's a very, very good question and um, a big debate in the speech community. Um, so well perceived. Um, there's basically two approaches. Uh, one is to ask people to read sentences and imagine they are experiencing a certain um, emotion. Um, the advantage of that is you sort of know what emotion at least they're aiming to uh, do. Sometimes you have voice actors doing that. They're a little bit better at it than uh, us normal people. Um, but sometimes that's not always possible. The other approach is to just look for, um, I don't know, something like EastEnders or various kind of shows or television programs and, and try and guess what, you know, that definitely they sound disappointed or they definitely sound angry. Uh, but of course, then the labels become a little bit uncertain. So there's these two schools um, of, of collecting data and they, they, none of them are perfect, I would say. <laughs> But in our case, we went for the um, prompted and try and act um, because, of course, there, there are very few people with dysarthria in, in uh, soap operas. Um, that's really interesting. I'll try and add, add more inquisition to when I'm asking <laughs> questions here. And so Craig asks, what software is used uh, to store um, um, this data? To store it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we sometimes uh, use sort of uh, general typical databases to kind of manage it, um, but otherwise we just kind of store it on our um, servers in, in Sheffield. Um, is, that, is that what I meant to store it or, or to process it? The, the storing is kind of pretty straightforward. Um, the processing in terms of, um, you know, we use a lot of high um, computing, high performance computing and, and GPUs and that sort of thing. I, I guess it's like, is there is there a preference in terms of a uh, do you use any of the kind of like the Microsofts or AWS's or Google's, etc.? Yeah, so for this type of data, we're not actually allowed to store it outside of uh, the secure service in Sheffield. So we can't use, um, for example, Amazon's uh, cloud based service or anything like that. Um, so it is stored in Sheffield for this data. Um, OK, so maybe maybe that's the, the question that was being asked. So the data yeah, being in general, the kind of processing systems, that's why I was a little bit unfamiliar with Microsoft is um, Linux and Unix and, and that sort of <laughs> way of, of working on, on computers. Um, yeah. Very good. So um, Jessica asks, is this research uh, being done on speakers of languages other than English? Oh, very good question. Uh, we are just in the process of doing exactly that. Or um, I should say rather looking at people with uh, non-English uh, native backgrounds, so like myself, for example. Um, so, of course, in the um, most Western countries these uh, days, it's a very multi-ethnic population. Of course, as they grow older, they also need to have access to for example, these tools for detecting dementia. But how do you do that for someone who's not fluent, perhaps in English? Um, so we're trying to look at how you can kind of mitigate that um, with the kind of tools, um, try and see how you can better accommodate people that comes from a slightly different language background. And have you have you found or have you or do you partner with other universities in different parts of the world or is this um, is a, just a research uh, program happening in your institution? Yeah, a bit of both actually. So there's uh, thankfully a lot of work happening all over the world, uh, from China to um, Brazil to Colombia to um, so lots of different languages are kind of represented in this world. But it's always dependent on people um, getting funding to record the data and, and finding local. Um, but for example, we took I didn't have time to show it here, but we took the digital doctor system to Kenya. Uh, where you would perhaps think, OK, intervention is not at the sort of top list of their kind of worries, but it is actually they have an increasing um, group of um, kind of middle class uh, and upper class people that live longer as long as we do in the Western world, uh, but they have such a shortage of neurologists. So I think they had, we met most of them, of, I don't know, nine, 14 neurologists to the whole of the 60 million people living in Kenya or something. So completely crazy. Um, so they could especially benefit from an automatic tool, for example, on a smartphone, because they're very well connected, actually, in terms of Internet and, and connectivity. I imagine that if um, like if it's the, the large scale, as you mentioned, in Great Britain, you're that's, is that universal? Like, like, is that for every country around the world? So there's a kind of like a, a shared and common interest for, for um, the healthcare professionals globally. Yeah, I would say. And actually, um, a lot of countries have surprisingly good funding uh, for healthcare applications. Um, not necessarily the UK, actually. <laughs> but, um, so there's a different kind of um, levels of kind of interest and funding from in the different countries, I think. And perhaps also, um, 
So in the UK and kind of Europe in general, I think we have a lot of companies really interested in this space, uh, which is helping us in academia. So that that's uh, for me one of the kind of really exciting things. Very good. I've just been given the two minute um, nod, so I've got two questions left. Um, okay. Brett, Brett has asked, is it possible to generate synthetic uh, synthetic data, for example, using GANS scans to compensate for the lack of data? Yeah, um, we have done that and that's a very good suggestion. So that is possible. It's not always easy um, because, of course, to generate. So this is a technique used a lot in, in sort of mainstream ASR, but to do for disaster, you really have to be able to pick up the peculiar areas or characteristics of that person's kind of uh, disaster to generate data that actually matches with um, what they're doing. But that sort of um, that and voice conversion techniques and those sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, super. And then finally, the last question goes to Gustavo. Uh, do you think a wearable device or an app would help in closing the gap surrounding data collection needed in this field? That would be fantastic. Um, it was still well, it would have certain problems. Ethical is one of them. Recording everything you hear and see is, or at least hear, is problematic. Um, getting the data labelled is problematic. So mostly we have chosen to ask people to read prompts because then we know what's been said. Uh, but free text is, is best. So if there's ways around that, that will be great. Um, Dr. Christensen, super. So that's all we have time for, for q and I'm going to hand you back to Rady now. Thank you, Ken, and thank you so much to Dr. Heidi Christians for a great presentation and discussion, and Ken for facilitating. Ken, I'm going to ask you to pop to the breakout rooms now, okay? And Heidi, I'm going to ask you to do the same. Um, they're going to go to the breakout sessions, and they're going. You, we're all going to move into a breakout call. So you think about this as a fringe festival. So in the chat now, you're going to have two links: one to a breakout room with Connor, uh, Dr. Connor again, and the second will be a breakout room with Dr. Heidi Christensen. These are intimate closed groups. This is your opportunity to get one to one time with the um, Dr. Christensen and with Dr. McGain about their wider work to deep dive into the topics uh, we discussed this morning and to talk about your own work, potential for collaboration. Uh, and that's what this is all about. So then after the breakout room, the breakout sessions, we're going to have a short coffee break, get the caffeine into you, and that's between 3 and 3.15. And we'll be back here at 3.15 for Dr. Morten Goodwin's um, from University of Agra in Norway. His uh, discussion and presentation around the obvious secrets to making AI uh, for wellness. I have seen this presentation. It is one to tune in for. Uh, and then we'll wrap up today with a presentation from Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, her bio is mind boggling. She's going to be super. I've seen her speak before. I'm really looking forward to it. So everybody will see in the breakout rooms and then pop back into the main stage here at quarter past three after the coffee break. You can use the link you got into the main stage already when you're coming back after your coffee. All right. And um, I'll see you all in there.
Welcome back. Welcome back to the second John McCarthy AI Summer School. I hope you've all refreshed after that caffeine hit. Take a minute. We've had a very busy two hours and we're running into the next two, which is all around those emerging tech, what's coming down the line, what's next. So it'll be quite exciting. I hope you enjoy that rich debate going on in the breakout rooms. I know Heidi was inundated with questions. Great, real technical deep dives going on in those breakout rooms. So super to see. So I would like to welcome Dr. Brido Dwyer, who is the head of SEED and senior lecturer in entrepreneurial learning and practice in Munster Technological University. They are a key partner here in the John McCarthy AI Summer School and Brida will intro and facilitate the discussion with our next speaker today. Brida, over to you. Hi, Radine, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. It is indeed very, very enlightening so far and I'm sure a lot more to come. So I'm delighted here to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Martin Goodman, uh, who is a professor at the University of Agder in Norway, and he's also the deputy director there for the Center of AI and Artificial Intelligence Research. And I guess apart from lecturing undergrad, masters and, and PhDs, I think Martin also has a lot, a lot of publications to his name. And most recently, the book that he wrote on AI for the myth of machines. And forgive me, Martin, I will not attempt to pronounce this with my fast carry speed accent in Norwegian. Uh, but very much uh, welcome here today to the John McCarthy uh, AI Summer School. And I guess we're all very much looking forward to the talk, which is, which is fundamentally about the obvious secrets to making AI for, for wellness. May I remind those who are, who are joining us in this session to please pop your questions into the Q&A function and we'll return after the presentation with Morton and share those questions with him and learn even more. So for now, Morton, it's over to you and welcome again. Great, and thank you for introducing me and thank you for inviting me and thank you for finding a picture of me that I took first day of high school as representation there. So I'm going to present, talk about AI, of course, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of my work and what is going on, what, how can we do that for wellness? What is the real secret to making AI and machine learning and deep learning really valuable for users, really valuable in healthcare and really valuable for the community as a whole? And I'll share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can very soon see the screen and somebody will shout out if not. No, it's good. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Great. And ultimately, of course, what I'm supposed to present is the secret to making AI for wellness. Uh, so my field of work is uh, in uh, machine learning specifically and more specifically that of deep neural networks, that type of technique that uh, mimics the human brain and that has been a lot, had a lot of attention the last years. Uh, and as probably some of your no, the idea of a neural network is uh, can be quite complex and it has existed for uh, a lot of years, but it is the recent advances, advances that has really made a difference in the application area of neural networks, both in research and in uh, what is done in real life. And one key aspect of what is really happening here is that uh, for the first time in history, I would say, there's a very, very short distance between research and practical usage. So for example, uh, some years ago, there was this open Kaggle competition on uh, trying to do uh, diagnosis, automatic diagnosis from image recognition uh, on the, the disease diabetic retinopathy. So that is a disease that, uh, affects a lot of people. It affects people with diabetes and it is not that tricky to diagnose, but it tends to be diagnosed too late because people don't uh, have, there's not enough capacity, etc. to make this really uh, work in practice. So a couple of years ago, there was this competition and it turned out as many of these uh, high level presentations are, uh, the AI was able to not only beat uh, other types of algorithms, but also beat uh, doctors, medical doctors. Uh, and then there's a lot of hype, of course, what really happens? <laughs> Do we need medical doctors? All of those things. And we, of course, know that that's, uh, that's mostly just hype. Uh, these tools are exactly that. Those are tools, but those are tools that come from the research area and then very, very, very quickly goes into the 
practical use as well. So in this example, this was an open competition. People were supposed to submit their algorithms and the deep neural network image classification methods won the competition by far. Many other competitions as well. This was one that uh, has at least a lot of attention. What happened? Well, two or three years later, uh, the same type of AI was put into practice uh, among other places in rural India. So in India, there is uh, sometimes lack of medical doctors. Uh, 70 million Indian people ha have diabetes. Often it is hard to get access to the patient, get access to the patient records. And uh, then this type of AI tool that turned out to then some people claimed were just uh, a way for researchers to play and have fun and make games uh, had a real, real impact uh, for real life Indian people. And this is exactly what we see in a lot of AI research. We see research that kind of uh, solves a relatively uh, minor task, uh, but then we see it very, very closely related to actual application areas in health, in uh, game playing, in uh, uh, sea, in agriculture, all over the place. It comes from the AI. So uh, what used to take years before it went from academia into real use of uh, users uh, can now only take uh, so few years or even months in some cases. And that is kind of what I see as the big strength of the AI research that is really happening. Most of the techniques, most of the methods have a long history. Uh, of course, there's methodical changes that has happened in recent years as well, but uh, it is much about uh, getting access to bigger data sets. It's much about getting access to faster computers, and it's much about the awareness that AI can actually solve and help uh, in real cases. And then that matters for many people, not only those that are interested in academic research. So we're a group that uh, we've been doing AI research for 20 years or so, uh, but in 2017, uh, the AI hype was at its highest, uh, and then we and started this center, Center for Artificial Intelligence Research. This was the day we opened it. We were very happy because that's what you are when you open a new center. Uh, and uh, two years later, 2019, we had grown to this size. And in 2021, we've of course grown much more, but then we don't meet physically, so we don't have a picture from that. And we run AI Research Center that does not only work on fundamental AI research, but we do a lot of collaboration with hospitals outside uh, in Norway. We do a lot of uh, uh, research across universities in Norway and uh, in Europe in general. And health is one of our ideas of working. Uh, in the Norwegian system, there's a lot of uh, other universities working on the same type of uh, technology. Uh, and the Universities of Norway have had this idea that they should all join forces together and make a big center together, and that center is called NOR. So all Norwegian universities and all uh, publicly funded research centers have joined this uh, consortium, NORA, and uh, so that we have the AI strengths together. So I see that as a kind of strength of the Norwegian AI research, meaning that we uh, have uh, trying, we're all trying to push the same uh, wagon in a way. We're all trying to make the same research. There. Additionally, we have uh, a building uh, that is meant for uh, measuring AI, uh, measuring patients, me measuring uh, and surveillance of patients uh, using AI. So meaning that uh, it's very often hard to get access to hospital data for privacy reasons, for example. It's very hard to get access to uh, hospital data from other universities because they, when you cross, uh, the data crosses lines, it causes problems. GDPR is one, exa one uh, reason for that, but there's other reasons that causes problems. So what the university decided to do is to make a building uh, and there we have uh, uh, beds and people can sleep there overnight <laughs> and we can measure them and then we have control over the data there. So there are medical doctors there, there are nurses in that building and in this particular case it is 
uh, our Minister of Health having a sleepover at our building, getting her sensor, her health measured, and of course some AI on top of it. So why I'm saying you that? What the reason is that uh, uh, what we see as big AI challenges, getting access to enough data, getting the data uh, used in real world cases, is what we're trying to push towards. Uh, and there are other challenges uh, with AI research as well. We all know that uh, AI can solve uh, tremendously complex tasks such as medical diagnosis, uh, but there's a lot of issues where we see AI research kind of coming to a short and we see much of the research kind of stagnating, uh, at least when we want to put it into practice. And one example of that is uh, is explainability or some we can even say interpretability. So can we really understand what the AI system is actually doing? It doesn't really matter that much if you're just using an uh, app on a uh, and you want to use some social media AI there, you just trust it in some way. But if you want to do it in uh, for wellness, for medical uh, diagnosis, that type of thing, you uh, understanding of what's actually happening, having understanding the impact, maybe having it's interpretable and explainable is really the key uh, to, to building trust. Because no medical doctor in the right mind would say, I want to use a system. I don't really understand it at all, <laughs> but I'll trust it. So that's not a medical doctor I know at least. Uh, so this example here are of some cats pro you probably see it, uh, and it kind of explains uh, a lot of what AI can and cannot do. So the first picture of this orange cat. Uh, this is not my research, but it's uh, some famous research that is there. Uh, uh, this is an orange cat, and we can see that these uh, well-known deep learning models, AlexNet, GoogleNet, is able to, with 100% accuracy uh, on that data set, categorize this as a cat. Not surprising, AI is very good at uh, categorizing cats from dogs. <laughs> and we see that humans, 99% of humans, are able to recognize this as a cat. I'm not sure the last percentage who's not able to see this as a cat, but at least most of them are. Uh, but the example goes further. Uh, in this case, we make the cat gray, grayscale, uh, and then we see that the uh, accuracy of the AI systems go down a bit. Uh, and then we can make the cat a silhouette, and the accuracy of the AI system goes down even further, and we can make the edges of the cat uh, only available to the AI system, and uh, the accuracy is down to at best 40%. Uh, by the human accuracy of detecting this as a cat um, remains high, in this case 87%. So why? Why does this happen? Well, of, of course, the AI system has been trained only with normal looking cats, and it has no way of knowing that sometimes you can draw a cat in a completely different way and still it should be recognized as a cat uh, like this one. We humans on the other hand we have some sort of in uh, a very strong intelligence meaning that we can expand beyond what we have seen in our training system. So I even though I've never seen a cat like this or a cat that is only a silhouette I can still recognize it as a cat. Uh, but AI systems fail at that, and that is a fundamental flaw, you could say, in AI, that it cannot really expand upon the data that it's been trained for. Let me show you another example. This is from our research. We, we do research on nutrition, uh, among others, uh, and the idea is that when you're supposed to go on a special diet, you're supposed to lose weight of, for some reason, the nutritionists tell us uh, that you should write down what you eat, uh, and then they tell us also that people who do that, they uh, lose interest in doing that uh, after a couple of uh, days and they have a tendency to cheat a bit and maybe write down uh, a bit less than what they're eating and all that sort of stuff. So the idea was you can make an app that take a picture of your food and you can get the food recognized automatically with AI, typically something that AI could do. So this is a typical Norwegian breakfast, some cheese and some butter, etc. Uh, and then when my students were working on this, they told me, that uh, it is the system is able to recognize this picture as cheese, bread, uh, grapes uh, with 100% uh, accuracy. OK, that, that's good. <laughs> and they told me also that it's able to calculate the amount of bread and the amount of butter. In this case, 4.4 grams of butter, 6.4 grams of cheese and 38 grams of bread. 
and then I became very suspicious because why uh, can you at all recognize the butter uh, that is 4.4 grams under the cheese there? It is seems super intelligent in a way that that is actually possible. It seems too good to be true. Uh, even though they claim they could show all the graphs that it has a very high accuracy, uh, my level of suspicion rose very quickly. Uh, and it turned out that our the, our nutritionist collaborators, they not only put the information in Excel spreadsheets as they were supposed to do, but they also had some post-it notes on all of the uh, our pictures. Uh, and on those post-it notes, just to be nice to us, they wrote down exactly that it is bread, 38-point gram, uh, butter, 4.4 grams, etc. And when we looked closer into the, what the AI system was actually looking at, we saw that it didn't care at all about what was on the plate. It only cared about what was on this post-it note on the left hand side. So it overfit, it overlearned from the system. Uh, and then if you only look at this post-it note, which is written in Norwegian, it's no problem. It's not hard to understand why it can understand that it is 4.4 grams of butter there because it's actually written there. When we removed all the post-it notes, the problem became a lot harder. Not impossible, but much, much, much harder. And why does this matter for wellness? Well, we see the same type of uh, flaw problem uh, in some published research. Uh, in some cases, there's a diagnosis of uh, cancerous moles, uh, uh, and the data set has been skewed in some way that if there is a ruler in the data set, in the picture, the chance of it being a cancerous mole increases a lot, simply because most of the moles in the data set has a ruler next to it <laughs> when when it's been taken, the picture has been taken at a medical uh, facility. Uh, while it's taken by other people, it has no ruler at all. But the fact that you actually add a ruler next to your picture does not affect uh, whether or not you're sick. So why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because it you skew the data in some way and it kind of artificially learns how to be very accurate but in truth it is not at all let's move to another example so this is uh, titanic uh, probably most of you have heard of titanic uh, and it's a ship that sank a couple of uh, more than 100 years ago uh, and uh, and some people have run an ai system to predict can you uh, predict with a high level of accuracy, who will survive the Titanic uh, crash? Uh, and of course, this is public data. You know a lot about uh, the patients there. You know about their gender, their age, etc. So no surprise, the AI system could predict that very well. But then we could add some uh, analysis, some statistical analysis on, on that data, more specifically something called Shapley analysis. And we can, in a way, ask the AI system what is the important factors about your prediction? So not only can you predict who will survive, but what is the features that you think is relevant, think in quotation mark, for doing a, an accurate prediction? And in this case, uh, the AI system claims that uh, the gender or sex of the person is the most important. Second is the class. Third is the age, etc. So, for example, uh, uh, if you're a male, uh, the chance of you surviving is a lot less than if you're a female. And if you're a first class uh, passenger, the chance of surviving is a lot higher than if you're a second class and or a third class. So uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, for example, who is a male and a third class uh, passenger would, according to this AI system, not survive. But uh, the other person, Rose, female, uh, first class citizen, will survive according to this system. And why is this important? Well, this adds a level of explainability on top of the accuracy. Uh, so that means that we can understand much more about what is actually happening in such an AI system, and that makes it much more useful for medical doctors to use in practice. You can just see a more complex example of the same. Uh, this is for predicting the presence of Alzheimer based on uh, cognitive uh, tests. Uh, the AI system can predict fairly accurately who has a mild cognitive problem and who has Alzheimer. Not perfectly, but very well. Uh, that's not the, uh, the reason for this graph. The reason for this graph is what is the 
impacting factors in this AI system? Well, in specifically this system, it is uh, the presence of cognitive dissonance, cognitive problems, that's the most important factor. Age is the second most important factor. Presence of the uh, poi uh, protein, third most important factor in this uh, AI system. And we can see that this makes sense. Age is something that we closely relate to the presence of Alzheimer because it mostly happens to old people, not young people. Uh, cognitive problems is something that we relate to Alzheimer's, so that is of course relevant, but not all cognitive problems are uh, for uh, or cause Alzheimer. There's a lot of other cognitive issues also. So I think explainability or interpretability is key to making uh, AI systems adapted into real world life. Uh, because uh, Pricewaterhouse, uh, they did a survey a couple of years ago and they asked, um, do you trust using AI in your healthcare system? So they didn't ask exactly where as a diagnosis or anything like that, just in general, do you trust using AI? And 39% said yes, and the remaining 61% said no. <laughs> so uh, about one third trusts having AI in their system, about two thirds say not at all. Then they asked uh, a different question. What about uh, if you have an AI system for your uh, significant other, your spouse, and then uh, the chance or the uh, agreement of using AI increased to almost a half. Uh, what does it mean? Well, AI is okay, but mostly not for me. <laughs> as long as it's for my wife, it's, it's totally okay. Uh, so that means that people trust AI in some sort of way, but they have some reason to suspicious, have a, um, uh, a, a way to think that this is not really something that is completely solved, something we should trust, but it is coming along. So. My famous example is uh, about uh, data handling, I think. So my, most, my, uh, my favorite example is about data handling. And this is, uh, uh, we do some work on Alzheimer prediction from images, MRI images. Uh, and, and it is very, very challenging to get uh, very good data on this. Uh, but we don't really need to collect our data itself. Uh, the reason is that there's a big US research uh, project called ADNI working on Alzheimer. And they've said uh, what's most important to us is to solve the problem of predicting Alzheimer. Uh, and they made all the data publicly available to the audience out there. So what has really happened is that there's a lot of high quality data with MRIs of people. Some have reached Alzheimer, some have not reached Alzheimer, and some have had a drinking problem, some have had a sleeping problem, some have had a drunking, the, the, uh, drug problem, and all that thing is anonymized, but still in the data. And what has happened in practice is that there is a competition among a lot of researchers to be the first to have a very, very good uh, prediction of Alzheimer based on MRI on this metadata. So data sharing is key to uh, really pushing the AI research forward. There's researchers all over the world working on that data that is quality assured and collected from US uh, uh, patients. And that is kind of what we're trying to do as well. So we're doing it uh, with uh, colonoscopy, uh, highly quality collected data from uh, uh, another research organization called Sintap in Norway. And then we have open competitions on exactly this. This data is quality assured, it is given uh, it's anonymized in a high quality way uh, and then the task is put out so that researchers, uh, mostly in Norway but other places also, can uh, develop their algorithms without thinking about data handling, thinking about all the other part that typically would be in such, such a system. And that also includes uh, using synthetic data, which was on the last talk before me, uh, in this case on ECG. So can you make a synthetic ECG signal that resembles the real one so that it becomes anonymized uh, and then can be used without having to have a privacy breach of the system? Uh, that makes it much easier to share data among people to put it online on the internet when the data is only synthetic uh, because there's no reason to believe that uh, patient sensitive information will be leaked in that way. 
and that's what we think is crucial when we when we also do our uh, age-related uh, macular degeneration research. That means uh, doing looking at the back of eyes together with medical doctors in order to understand uh, what causes uh, the blood vessels to break in a specific way and detecting it early. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a strong collaboration between medical doctors, eye experts, <laughs> and uh, uh, we who are deep learning neural network experts uh, working on that, uh, that problem. Uh, they have a lot of experience in eye diseases. We have experience in uh, understanding machine learning and, uh, and data sharing, making that data available to the public is uh, highly relevant, I would say. Uh, another type of research we do is which what we call the home service for, for um, uh, people who are typically elderly but have some uh, uh, many diseases at the same time, comorbidity. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of patients that have COPD uh, from smoking and other uh, uh, other lung diseases. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they have uh, some heart problems and all uh, a lot of it at the same time. Then uh, each patient becomes very complex and it's hard to really uh, say uh, it's a single disease that you want to diagnose. Uh, so what we're doing here is that we do AI prediction of how, how the patient will be uh, affected by the disease in the next day, the day coming or the day following and the day after that. Uh, and the reason we do that is not to say, uh, to tell you you will become sick soon, but to make sure that the nurses that go out and visit the people at their home can really understand how to prioritize. Because if the system goes, uh, produces an alert, you should prioritize that, this, that patient that has that type of uh, uh, predicted uh, worsening of the disease. Because most of the existing systems are just based on threshold values. If your pulse is this high, or if your blood pressure is this low, then there's an alert, but all medical researchers tell us that it's more complex than that. Of course it is. It's not uh, based on common uh, thresholds, but it is. Uh, it all depends on what you've eat, been eating that day, what you've been, uh, if you've been near a bonfire, for example. That time. So the secret here is, of course, to make sure uh, that the AI system uh, is a decision support tool for those with medical expertise. Other research that we're doing is in uh, psychiatric work, uh, and that is meant for teenagers that have uh, psychiatric uh, issues or want to have psychiatric questions. Uh, there's a lack of psychiatrists that could help these teenagers, uh, and they tell us that there's a lot that a lot of these questions that uh, are uh, the same for many of the patients, and they're not that serious, but then there's a lot of questions that are very serious and they want to focus on those that they need a lot of attention to. Uh, and the idea is that you uh, filter out and say these issues here are very important that you talk to a real human psychologist and these questions here are uh, normal teenage problems that you can get uh, uh, a robot to help you with. Not to automize completely, but to kind of help you uh, in, in some uh, 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 relatively simple way. And what it turns out that these uh, students or these uh, teenagers that work with the use the system, they not only uh, trust the system, but they trust it even more than talking to a medical doctor because it's somehow anonymized when there's a robot there doing the analysis instead of a real human there. So you see that the patients are really opening up even more because they're talking to an AI, not despite they're talking to an AI system. Uh, the chat system is simple, uh, but key to it is to detect whether something is really, really problematic and you should then contact a real life person there as well. Some of the other research that we're doing is analysis of uh, medical patient journals. Uh, and that means that it becomes decision support tools to medical doctors and to uh, develop a system that looks very similar to the system that they already have in place. Uh, and then highlighting uh, important information in a complex and large medical journal. 
Uh, and that is important because some of these medical journals are enormous. <laughs> so thousands of pages sometimes. <laughs> and it is unrealistic to ask a medical doctor to read all of that before an emergency uh, operation, for example. But to get some important parts highlighted so that they can look at it more closely. So in this case, it's about allergies. Uh, here are, is a person that is uh, allergic to penicillin and it's not only looking at the word penicillin of course but sometimes this is written as allergic to sometimes it's written as reacting to and sometimes it's written in a very very different way uh, so uh, last point i wanted to make before i reach the conclusion of my project is uh, presentation is that we see this huge need for data uh, and we see this advance in uh, uh, what's called semi-supervised learning semi-supervised learning is that you uh, make up some sort of game, some sort of puzzle of your data so that you can uh, uh, learn only without the need for doctor supervision of the data. So in this case, you have a car, you make a puzzle of it, and the AI is supposed to puzzle it back. And we see that research not only for cars, but for things like prostate cancer and other uh, tumors uh, in the brain, uh, uh, they're about. So, the obvious secret to making AI for wellness is three things, as I see it. It is to have a concrete and measurable problem. You need a problem that can be, you can mathematically define in some sort of way. It is to seek the power of your data. You have a lot of data, understand what the power is of it and understand what it isn't. Share the data if you can uh, and use shared data. And I would say most importantly is to understand the problem and the process itself. And that understanding is both about understanding the algorithm, what it does and what it doesn't do, how does it influence, what does it really mean when it does something, and understand the, and understand the problem, which then means uh, often in our case, the work for medical doctors. Thank you. Morten, thank you very much. Uh, I could listen to you for a lot longer. Um, it's been, it's been uh, extremely interesting. Uh, did you want to say something else there? Are you okay? No, or, no. Okay. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of questions coming in and a lot of people, uh, I suppose, curious about more and more information. And as, as, as you talk and we hear the complexity of the body and the mind in itself, without even bringing in the AI and the AI combined really creates opportunity for a lot of innovation, really, and a lot of challenging thought process being put forward there. And certainly I was listening to you there talking about the youth as well. And we look at post-COVID now and done some research there previously and, and the implication it's having for their mental wellness. and curious in the fact that they trust the anonymous uh, AI person more than than the real the real person. It's it's really does present opportunity and challenges. Absolutely. But it's not that surprising because when I have something wrong with my body, the first thing I do is to Google it, right? It's anonymous. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, if it becomes really problematic, I call my MD. Yeah. So it's the anonymized uh, fine way yeah. of using a system. Yeah. OK, uh, again, I'd love to talk to you about more on that and maybe another time. Uh, but some of the questions that are, that are coming in, uh, Fran is asking the question uh, regarding how is the density of the cheese bread uh, measured through a visual tool? All right, oh. okay. so it is measured using something called um, uh, semantic segmentation. And that means that we uh, pixel wise find out where the cheese is, uh, where the bread is, where the butter is. And then uh, there is a well known or there's a uh, table basically saying that if you have cheese and this amount of cheese given the ruler of this size then you can calculate the the, the grams and also the energy that is used uh, so the actual calculation of the energy uh, of cheese uh, calories uh, is calculated just from a simple table uh, the presence of uh, cheese is just pixel wise uh, amount uh, of uh, of cheese and butter etc and that is there so segmentic segmentation, a technique called YOLO, is uh, is very relevant there. OK, thanks, Martin. Uh, uh, another question coming in from Liam uh, asks, what are the ethical challenges you have to overcome when gathering the data? And where do you source the synthetic data from? Well, there's, there's, there's of course, ethical challenges uh, with data collection. Uh, but I would say many of them are solved by anonymization and some of them are solved by having the uh, AI run at the hospital instead of having them run 
uh, at uh, our university. So what we do is we develop the system and then we push it to a computer at the universe at the hospital, and the, the and they have all the security in place. They have all the that that in that in place, uh, and then we don't have to ask the patients for um, uh, confirmation that we can use the data because it is then part of the medical hospital system that is there. So if I were to ask to do that on my own computer in the university, I would get that data and I would need to ask permission from all 500,000 patients in that system. That's unrealistic, <laughs> really. So what we do is we have um, a small set that we've asked permission for. We train it locally and then we push it to the system and uh, at the hospital and then and we test it out there. Uh, so I would say the ethical parts of that is uh, is uh, uh, is maybe uh, when this puts restriction into place that says that we cannot use it. <laughs> There's some politicians that say that we're kind of breaching privacy issues there that not asking permission to use AI on their system. And that is a bigger ethical challenge, I would say, than actually using it because the medical doctors, they tell us this is a helpful tool. It potentially saves lives and that is uh, uh, not using is a bigger ethical issue than other. But you can of course talk about privacy and all of those things. Uh, that could be issues as well, but we, we don't really reach them, I say. And the other part of that question was, where do you source the synthetic data from? All right. Ah, so there's uh, this is uh, this different synthetic data. Uh, I think uh, most relevant was the prostate the synthetic data, maybe uh, that I talked about at the very end. That was. Uh, that is based on an, an open data set that is synthetic. Now that is that is publicly available, and then we use something called a generative adversarial network. It's kind of a gun. Uh, you kind of play a game with the with the system to make data that looks like that data, and then then we get the synthetic data from there. Uh, so the ECG data that is synthetic data from uh, from from patients, and then we uh, do the same type of generative method, make the synthetic data that looks like the real data, and then we ask the medical doctors, can you see any difference between those? And they say no, and then we push it out and we say it out. So that so the uh, prostate cancer is data that is a public data set somewhere. The ECG is some medical uh, medical uh, hospital data that we have uh, at the hospital. Yes. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Uh, another question coming in from Andy yeah. is to if you could elaborate on the point of seeking the power of your data. If you could elaborate a bit more on that. Right, sure. So what I mean by that is uh, is to understand uh, what is the value of the data. Uh, it means that trying to say uh, in, let's say, medical diagnosis, there there is some relevant factors that are there. There are some relevant factors that are not there. Uh, uh, for example, if you uh, there's there's uh, in GDPR there's something called uh, data minimization, <laughs> and that means that you sh should select beforehand what are the relevant parts of the data. So that is not seeking the power of data. Seeking power of data is to uh, push the data into a system and then let it ask itself uh, what is the relevant factors and then see through scientific methods what is uh, how accurate is it is it really doing. So I would say seeking the power of data is to understand what data you have and then trying to uh, do a methodically correct way of uh, uh, doing it correctly. OK, we have one more question. There are more, a lot more questions, but we're going to have time for one more because we're almost out of time, Martin, if you don't mind uh, sure. taking this last one, where David has asked, what's the future challenges uh, your research will look at? What are they, the future challenges of your own research right now? Well, we'll be looking at uh, uh, multiple sclerosis now. We have just uh, applied for some funding. Hopefully the Norwegian Research Council agrees that that is what we should do research on. And that is challenging for several reasons because the data set is smaller. So this smaller data sets uh, and it's challenging because it's it's not clear from from medical point of view what what causes that in Alzheimer's there's some plaque in the brain multiple sclerosis is something more complex so that means that we add, we add a level of explainability so maybe it can even push the research of uh, medical research as well saying that when this person develops multiple sclerosis it is because of this and this, and this. so hopefully that is uh, some of the future research that we will be doing
There are further questions, but I can see Radine is getting anxious for us to move on to the next session. Uh, but if uh, if we could very, very quickly, Radine, if you don't mind, we've got two or three minutes left to go. If that's OK. Uh, Nija has asked that the techniques of data augmentation depends on the task, uh, classification or segmentation. Yes, so uh, if the, the techniques of data augmentation depends on the task, uh sure it does uh, because um, because when you do segmentation you need to label it in some some way uh, uh, and the labeling of segmentation means pixel wise saying this and this and this pixel is cheese this and this and pixel is not cheese if you do classification you just need cheese not cheese so it depends absolutely but i think for the augmentation part uh it's not that different because you uh, we don't really do data augmentation that much for segmentation. We could, of course, uh, but I think uh, it doesn't matter that much, I think, as far as I can tell, because you, you push it into the same generative network. Of course, it's uh, the mathematics might be a little bit different, but not that much. So we say data augmentation is at least very similar to, depending on the task. I would say it's not identical to very similar. OK, in Asia, I hope that has helped uh, answers a part of uh, the question that you've asked, and I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to follow up subsequently on this. So at this stage is for me to say, Martin, thank you sincerely. The time flew by uh, and could go on and on. There are more questions coming in, but we, we can forward them, them on to you directly subsequently. Thank you indeed and uh, enjoy the rest. I'm sure you're staying with us for the rest of the summer school and it's now back to you, Radine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brita, and a huge thank you to you, uh, Dr. Morton Goodwin, for joining us here today. I am a little mind blown about that, that real collaboration and creativity that we can learn so much from with the Norwegian model. It's yeah, super to see. So we are up for our last speaker of the day, the final speaker today. So Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos is with us. She's the senior vice president at Emerging Tech Insight. Uh, for of Emerging Tech Insights for a no, no before. She was formerly the Science and Engineering Technological Advisor at the United States Joint Special Operative Univers Operations University and served as Innovation Advisor to the US SOCOM. So for all of us that aren't from the States, the United States Special Operation Command is in charge of overseeing various special operation commands, things like think the Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force and the US Armed Forces. So they're involved in things like um, counterterrorism, unconventional warfare, counter narcotics. Dr. Lydia's work, like, it lies in that intersection between national security strategy, technology. She forecasts emerging threats around disruptive technology, uh, participates in NATO science for peace programs and uh, during the Obama administration Lydia was awarded the US Presidential Service Award for her service to the cybersecurity community. So that's not all. She holds an executive education certification and cybersecurity uh, policy from Harvard Kennedy School of Business. She is USAD Joint Certified for Humanitarians Operation. Lydia holds a PhD in Political Science and Security Policy from the Euro uh, University of Siena. I'm not so sure what I've been doing, but she's been very busy, but she's not limited to um, just technology based interests. And she also has her own fashion label called Empowering Workwear. Um, workwear uh, and it's by Lydia and she's an artist and launched an art series about the human experience with technology. We are delighted to hang one of our pieces here in RDI Hub and we just want to say a massive thank you um, and a huge thank you to Lydia. I think we're just having a little bit of technical issues so give us one second um, we're just back live now. I think we were out. Uh, don't know how much you missed, so I'm not so sure. Um, so I'm just going to reintroduce Lydia. So Lydia is joining us from uh, the US. Uh, she has a really impressive 
CV, uh, that intersection between, you know, um, security and technology and those emerging technologies. She she's worked with national security um, and she's lying in that intersection between national security strategy and technology. She forecasts emerging threats around disruptive technology and participates in the Native Science for Peace program. And during the Obama administration, Lydia was awarded the US Presidential Service Award for service to the cyber community. She holds executive education and certification on cybersecurity policy from Harvard Kennedy School of Government and is a USAID Joint Certified for Humanitarian Operations. Lydia holds a PhD in political science and security policy for the universe, from the University of Siena. However, she does not limit herself to just technology based interests as she also has her own fashion label called Empowering Workwear by Lydia and Lydia is an artist. And launched an art series about the human experience with technology and we are delighted to hang one of the her pieces in RDI Hub. Uh, it's on, sh on shipment to us at the moment and we'll send you a, a, a snap when we get it and hang it. So thank you for that generosity, Lydia. Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, we welcome you to the John McCarthy AI Summer School. I have been looking forward to your talk all day. Welcome. Absolutely a pleasure to be here. How are you? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I so look forward to this uh, conversation and I look forward to the questions. Um, it's been uh, amazing to hear the other speakers and I think that now I'll be closing the day with kind of a uh, holistic perspective to see kind of what technologies are out there and place them in the context of AI wellness technologies that are intangible, tangible and embedded. Um, so with that, I will start my presentation. Um, first thing, I like to believe that we should have a mindset around technology. We've got so many new technologies coming at us and being developed at such a rapid pace. And I think that while we should embrace new technology, we should be also consciously and purposefully tech forward with them. Um, a quote that I always love to share is from Andrew Nigg, who says that just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today it is AI that will transform everything else. So if you can think about how uh, a little over 100 years ago, you had your kettle that became electrified, you had your stove that became electrified. It's that same revamping of our world around us, but with the cognitive element inside it. So um, as this talk is about the different AI technologies and wellness, I thought it is only befitting that we have a baseline definition for artificial intelligence and one for wellness. So I chose the one from the Oxford Dictionary, and it is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech re recognition, decision making and translation between languages. Although I think that we can start to augment our understanding of AI um, as we incorporate more sensors, particularly in, in the healthcare domain. Wellness, this is from the World Health Organization, the WHO. Um, I love this definition, it's my favorite one for wellness. They classify wellness as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So just because you're not sick, in the disease sense, it does not mean that you have wellness. And I like this holistic approach of physical, mental, and social well being. So, those are the two definitions we will uh, approach this presentation with. The reason I wanted to separate um, some of these technologies in these three categories is because I think that our relationship to technology matters, and um, we humans experience things through an embodied experience. Our, our consciousness and everything that we do in the world is, is done from inside our body. Um, we see through our eyes in our body. We experience the world, whether it's cold or hot, through our, our senses on our body. And then similarly, the cognitive space, our brain uh, through um, many years of evolution has uh, evolved to the way it is now where we still have the amygdala that looks for danger and protects us from that danger. And I thought that if this would be a nice way to kind of understand how 
we humans will relate to this technology. So uh, starting with intangible, um, it doesn't have a physical form, as you would imagine, uh, because it is intangible. And th these kinds of AI technologies are the kind that you would basically have a user interface that you interact with um, on an app, or it could be a voice command um, interaction. So um, one of the, the biggest spaces in this intangible AI wellness space is really um, battling mental health um, challenges. And the, the ones that I'm going to show here, these are, these are some that have really tried to push the bounds in terms of various ways of delivering this kind of uh, healthcare. So um, before we rapidly try to say that an AI could be better than a human therapist, um, I think it's always important to fall back on that, uh, regardless if it was a physical or a cognitive task. Um, it has always been proven so far that um, even when an algorithm can beat a human or excel uh, better than a human at one task, it is always the human machine together that beats the algorithm alone. And so we need to look at these technologies as something that m augments us and makes us better, but not something that needs to replace us. So um, in this sense, uh, one of the interesting findings is, is that an AI therapist um, can elicit more information from patients than a human would. And um, what they found is, is that there's a, the inhibition is reduced because humans feel less judgment because it's not another human that's, that they're saying these vulnerable things to, and instead it's an algorithm. So uh, one example is Adicade. Um, this is an app to help people who have uh, addictive behaviors that they're trying to work through. Um, it could be um, an addictive behavior with alcohol, uh, or it could be with drugs or other things. It could even be with gaming. And um, it's what I've found that these technologies are like is almost like a coach, a human coach that's there by your side to kind of give you those tips that you need and be there to nudge you. Um, so this is one of those apps. Um, what you can do with it is you can journal your own um, your own feelings, uh, what you've done, and they can even help you by finding local support groups where you can go to in times of need. And this app actually can also start to sense when you are probably going to engage in an addictive behavior and uh, give you small bits of encouragement uh, before you do. A different app, but again, the same intangible concept is uh, Wobot. Um, Wobot is a app where you can um, have chat conversations about your mood and how you're feeling. And what I, I think is really nice about this is, is that it's sometimes it's just as simple as having someone ask you a question, why or why, why are you feeling that this way? Or could you tell me more about that? to help us figure out for ourselves um, why it is we feel the way we do and help us navigate some of the complexities of our thoughts that when we get them out, we can understand much better than when they're ruminating in our head. And uh, the, the, one of the advantages of these types of um, apps is that it's really 24 hours a day. It does not take vacations, no holidays. And so it's one of those things that you could just have at, at a moment's need. Um, so some studies found that just after two weeks of using Wobot, participants experienced a significant reduction in depression and anxiety. And I think that this has to do um, from an epistemological well-being perspective in the sense that when you know why you're feeling what you're feeling, you feel better. That's, that's my hypothesis as to why um, people have felt a reduction in depression and anxiety, because this um, algorithm has helped them um, clear through some of those uh, feelings. Another uh, option, this is at a university in the US, is they're looking at multiple choices where you can engage and provide input. So this one's a, a decision tree algorithm. And then another one which I think is quite interesting is one where you use the camera and um, the algorithm processes the emotions in your face as you are responding. And then the algorithm responds to you, but based on what your face is doing. So this is almost like a human trying to get cues from body language and also voice intonation. 
And there are already algorithms that you can uh, put together, algorithms that understand a happiness in the voice or sadness in the voice or anxiety. Um, and this one includes also the gaze, where the eyes are looking up and down. Um, so this one is an app that is meant to help therapists um, take notes, but this is an example of human machine teaming, and it's also HIPAA compliant. And again, I think that it's so important where we don't just say we are offloading some of this very important emotional labor that um, we do need professionals to take part in, but it is something where we can make those professionals um, be better at their job. So moral of the story is that human machine teaming is um, the, the more effective approach. Um, so moving away from, from the, the mental health focus, um, another wellness application that hopefully will be coming to a hotel near us is this initiative of the Hotel Room of the Future by Marriott. And the idea is that they would take your, your profile for, for those who already have memberships with different hotels and get points, you would have a, a broader built out profile where when you enter the room, the room would welcome you. I mean, you, you can sometimes already see in the screen, you know, that it says hello to you with your name, but it would be for, far more than that, where it would have the lighting exactly how you liked it at the time that you'd like it. Um, it would also have uh, images of your family, for example, nearby um, in the digital picture cases, and also provide you the type of exercise that you like, whether it's yoga or HIIT, or any other kind of activity because it knows what you like and what you want. And so this makes the hotel experience more personalized. Um, so this example is intangible and almost tangible. The reason it's not in the tangible category is because you don't interact with something physical. You give something physical. So um, Viome is a company that will do a gut test for you, um, but you need to provide them a stool sample. And um, what they'll do is they will tell you all the bacteria that is inside your gut, but because they have um, these algorithms that they've developed over time, they can tell you what types of food work better with your gut bacteria composition. And these are kind of examples of AI health wellness technologies that are available to the average consumer that can really change one's life. So you can all of a sudden start to eat foods that, that mesh better with your body. They give you um, what, what foods are your superfoods, what foods are your avoid foods. And then they also give you a breakdown of the inflammation in your gut, the, your digestive efficiency, and tips on how you can improve it. And the more algorithms we have in these spaces, the more personalized medicine we're going to have as well. So, um, now into the tangible category. The tangible is something where we've got an algorithm that is embedded in something physical that we physically interact with. Um, in the sleep domain, there are many of those and sleep is one of the most powerful things for our immune system, just rest and recovery. It's the longevity clinic, free longevity clinic. And these technologies uh, help you better understand what your sleep profile is and nudge you in that right behavior. So again, we have this pattern of coaching that algorithms help coach us in the right direction. So um, with this, it's on the side of your bed. You don't have to uh, hold it um, and it can read what your heart rate is and how you slept and give you light, uh, your light sleep, your deep sleep and all of that. Um, it also helps you clear your mind. It has a, a piece of it where you can just put your thoughts down before you go to bed because sometimes people have a hard time sleeping because they're thinking about all the things they need to do the next day. Um, and then they also have some music that can help soothe. Um, but it's really the AI piece where it gives you that um, kind of corrective nudging behavior based on all of the data that it has captured. The same for the sleep pillow. Um, same concept. And now that we, when we think about algorithms and we think about devices, um, we also have to think about the other layer of, of smart home compatibility because more and more people are start to, starting to embed um, operating systems inside their home. Um, a very popular one is the, the Google one and the Amazon one. Um, so 
these are things that are also coming about. So it's like almost an AI within an AI. Um, this one is um, my personal favorite. It's something I use. Uh, I've been using it for 14 months and I can um, confidently say that it has really helped me understand myself and understand how I can improve my sleep. The algorithm has been particularly um, accurate and interesting from the narrative perspective. So it takes just like the other ones, it takes the data and then it, it gives you a narrative in the morning and it says, um, did you eat something la late last night or did you have a, a workout right before you slept? And it tends to, to know um, what I've done um, when I haven't slept well. But it also similarly when I sleep well, it tells me, you know, you've done great, but I know I can pinpoint what are the things I did to do better. And little things like this is where AI becomes my coach and it helps me be a better person by understanding what are the things that I can improve with myself. Um, I don't think that this takes away uh, human professionals in the wellness space. What it does is it helps me be have more agency and have more information when I come to, for example, a doctor and I can say, listen, you know, my sleep pattern has been like this. There's an anomaly. It's been happening for, you know, two weeks and it doesn't make sense because I can tell you from 14 months of sleep tracking that this is not normal. Something's wrong. Um, eventually, I imagine that uh, I hope not too far away from now, we will see more of this in our GP um, in, in our GP's office so that we can relate better to our data ourselves and improve. Uh, another one I think is very interesting is the, the space of exercise. Again, with the same coaching theme, this home exercise equipment has an algorithm and metrics and it follows you through just like a personal trainer would. But being able to see those stats and see how you're improving is very motivational. So moving away from these kinds of coaching um, wellness, it, tangible app, apps and stuff, um, I think other ones that are really important are the ones that make us feel um, calm and cuddly and help us um, relax our nervous system. And this is an example of Pero, the um, seal, and it has it's it it moves around. It can look you in the eyes and it has provided a lot of good feelings for both the elderly in homes as well as kids, as you can see here. Um, this one doesn't have AI, but I bring it up only because it is only a matter of time before robots like these are in the hospital with algorithms as well embedded in them. And it could be simple things like being able to have the information of the heart rate and oxygen levels and all of that. Uh, this one is um, for elderly care. I think that uh, we, we can notice already, particularly in industrialized countries, the rise of loneliness. And this is something that we're going to have to consider as potentially part of uh, our elderly care. Um, finally, in the tangible section, um, there are sex robots that have been around for a long time. But uh, the novelty recently is having AI embedded inside the robots so they can communicate to you. And um, for those who think that this is just a vanity object, it, it doesn't have to be really. There are people who feel very lonely and would like to have um, someone that they can talk to um, that looks like a human and this can provide companionship. Uh, the interesting uh, piece is that they have an app where you don't need to have the robot. You can just have the app and you can create the personality that you want of the person. And in the screen, you'll see it has like courage, sensuality, humor, um, cruelty, humility. Um, so this also definitely raises uh, questions around the ethics of trying to create a personality that you want to interact with. In another hotel example is removing people from the hotels. This is in Japan where they have robots, including dinosaurs, to welcome you to the hotel room and help you check in. And so it is, I haven't tried it yet, but I'd definitely love to go and experience it. But I have an inkling that I would feel lonely in the experience. There's something wonderful about having human interaction. Finally, uh, the last section is the embedded artificial intelligence. So we had some examples of intangible and tangible. And by no means is this a comprehensive uh, presentation, but 
um, there are sprinkles to, to kind of give a feel of the collective um, umbrella of different AI wellness technologies. And this one, um, this is, I think, probably the most uh, ethically contentious one because it's about interacting directly with your brain and a computer. So um, DARPA is looking to see how there could be brain computer interfaces, whether it is um, sending electricity to the, mot the motor cortex to stimulate um, a certain part of the brain to reduce anxiety, or whether it is actually putting something inside um, on top of the brain. So that would definitely be going through the skull into the brain. Um, so this is one angle that this has been explored is for mental health um, problems. Uh, right now, Neuralink is uh, making the biggest breakthroughs for brain computer interface. Neuralink is owned by Elon Musk, and they are trying to create a minimally invasive um, brain computer face device. And when I say minimally invasive, it still is drilling through your skull to put something on top of your brain. And right now, they've managed to have uh, monkeys play games with each other just using their brain. And this has a whole um, a whole slew of different uh, ways that this can be used for wellness, but also where we do need to consider what are the ramifications of having something in one's brain. Um, another aspect um, I th is part of the grieving process. Um, there are some ways where you can take the the text messages and videos and voice of a loved one who's passed away and try to recreate them um, in an algorithmic form where you can interact. And there's people who have done so and have done so quite successfully in the sense that um, it has the, the responses have been very similar to what the person would have said. Um, this is something that would probably need to be explored from the psychology angle to, to understand how helpful this could be or how harmful this could be. Um, and obviously questions of what did the person who passed away give consent to, to this being done? And this is kind of a looking ahead path, but although it kind of exists today already. Um, so there are some people already talking about um, posthumous personhood. Um, and that's something I think that we should consider in terms of the grieving wellness process. And then finally, um, this is an interesting company. They're called Nectome and what they are doing is they keep your brain um, right right before you die they will come and um, do a procedure and keep your brain and the idea is that they want to recreate all of your network in your head um, and bring it back in a digital form whether or not your consciousness would be there or not is is open to ethical debate um, but this is a, a very interesting new phenomenon so to conclude, uh, technology is amazing. And we need to be aware of how it works so that we can better understand whether or not to take it seriously, whether or not to use the algorithmic decision support as uh, a credible uh, sounding board. Um, we also need to set boundaries on technology use. As much as I am a huge fan of technology, I think that part of having wellness with AI and other tech is also having healthy boundaries and for every person that looks different. And then uh, we also need to create a safe space of information absorption. And what I mean by that is, is that it can be very overwhelming to receive so much information about your body that you may not even know what to do with it. And so it's important to, to take that information in a way that you can absorb and on your schedule. Otherwise it can be too overwhelming. And then, um, claim and reclaim agency and privacy. So um, one of the things that these technologies can do is give us more agency to understand who we are and how we want to uh, move our life our, and our wellness and our health forward. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we continue to maintain that agency of this is what I want to do, this is not what I want to do, and not relinquish that and, and give it to an algorithm and outsource our decision making completely to an algorithm because the algorithms may not always be correct. And privacy is, is important as well, and it's important to understand how much of your data you're giving away and how it's being used and where you feel comfortable on that spectrum. And then lastly, not lose sight of our embodied um, experiences and our needs that we have with other humans. 
and it's simple. I think with COVID, many of us can appreciate the, the wonder of sitting with someone and having coffee in person and how different that is from having a Zoom coffee with someone. So um, I think it's befitting to, to end with loneliness, um, that loneliness will not end when the pandemic ends. And this is a, an epidemic that, that we have and technology can help, but we need to make sure that we are uh, having that, that agency that I talked about before and saying, Technology can help me up to here, but after that, I want the, the human aspect of it and understand where your human machine teaming is. And then finally, um, another thing, you know, it's I, it's, it's going to be ironic that I've talked about technology in, in such positive ways and then want to conclude by saying you you may want to consider technology detox. Um, having a lot of technology can can create burnout. We're always on our screens, always looking at apps and everything is on the phone. And so I think it's also important for our wellness to sometimes take space from all of it. Um, so I invite you to um, take a look at a game I created. It's about questions um, around the different emerging technologies that affect our human experience from birth to death. It's available online at sapien2-0.com and it's in five languages, uh, English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic. And I hope that this could be a continuation of our talk today. And um, I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, oh, there were so many moments in the talk that my mind kind of exploded. And I am getting lots of messages here and everyone's having a similar experience. Just such, uh, what yeah. felt futuristic becomes very, um, close all of a sudden uh, and it was really nice that yourself and, and the first speaker we had on today Dr. Connor McGinn uh, came with the same solution almost that it was a it was not an either or AI or human it was AI and and, and he had data to, to show that so um, I'm lighting up your question, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, so Frank asked and this came up a lot in the questions how far is too far AI in your opinion for him he's like I, I may draw the line at constructing a partner virtual with a personality embedded but curious to know your perspective. Um, so I think that something we need to realize is is that that window of what's normal and acceptable shifts over time and there's this wonderful expression of uh, from the ages between 0 and 15 everything is normal like if you grew up with a VCR, that's how the world was. If you grew up with color TV, that's how the world was. Same thing with internet and touch screens. If whatever it is that exists when you are between 0 and 15, that's how the world is. And then between 15 and 35, all the new technology is just cool and new. And then after 35, it's just against humanity and the way things should be. Um, so it's it's a funny uh, expression, but I think that it, it drives the point home that there are generational differences and also culture does change. So if you think about many of you will remember the 90s and you will remember phone calls and you will remember dating in the 90s was very different to dating today. And so times change and we also change about what we think is acceptable and not in the 90s saying that you met a stranger online and then got married with them could have been pretty bizarre back then, but now um, actually it's quite common. And so when it comes to these technologies, I, I think it's the same thing where the more that we start to see them in our surroundings, the more that we start to trust them, the more it just becomes normal. Um, and, you know, we already have AI all around us. You know, when you use Google Maps at, to go somewhere, that's an algorithm helping you out. When somebody uses Amazon Alexa in their home to tell them the weather, or other things, it's that's an algorithm that is a support at home. So I think that the line is different for every person um, because of our comfort levels. So for me personally, I um, I'm trying to use the things that I think are going to help my life the most and go in the direction that I want to go in where I feel comfortable. This is the agency piece. So for me, I've used um, the sleep ring and I've used Biome. Um, because I wanted to focus on nutrition and see how I can improve my nutrition and also my sleep when COVID happened, I, I got that to, and they both worked out, but I will say with the Viome, it was more information that I could handle. It probably take me a year to probably 
absorb all of that information. So I just took the food and then I can get to the others at another time. But I'm setting those healthy boundaries where I realize that it's just too much, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Jonah actually, it's kind of a, an add on. Jonah asked, do you think the convenience AI brings to the table could pose negative effects to cognitive thinking? Yes. So, um, yes, and how? So, we've already seen research to show that. Um, we are cognitively more lazy because we have everything on our phone. Um, the phone is an extension also of our memory and our capabilities. We don't remember phone numbers anymore. We don't remember anyone's emails or anything like that because we've got the phone. And so you might say, oh, is this a bad thing? Should we go and start memorizing everybody's phone numbers? If you want to. I mean, so, I mean, so this is where you have to rationalize and say, what is it that I feel comfortable with allowing the, the algorithm to take care of? And what is it that I don't? And and this is comes into the self knowledge. And for me, I think self knowledge is a huge part of wellness. And this is why when I, I said technology is great and we need to understand it better. So, you know, and you say this is my risk appetite. This is um, my privacy appetite and say this is where I fall on these spectrums and I want to use this for this. And I understand that by using my phone for, for the memory of all of my phone numbers, I am not remembering those things. Yeah, absolutely. And you're talking about having a knowing your own appetite risk, knowing your own limitations, right? And what you're comfortable with. And as 35 plus adults, we can do that. But when it comes to kind of monitoring our children's uh, experience with this type of technology, where is best practice? It, it, it's a little more blurred. Yeah, I mean, and that's a wonderful question because children, so, you know, the, the zero to 15, I mean, everything is normal to them. So uh, I can't tell you the countless examples I've had of friends where they go on vacation and the kid walks into the hotel room and says, Alexa, like, no, Alexa's not here, but why isn't Alexa here? And, you know, it's simple things like that. And then um, or another funny story about technology. One kid went to they went to this rustic um, hotel and the, the hotel room had a phone like hotel rooms do have phones that are connected to the wall. And the kid who was six told his dad, Dad, why is the phone connected to the wall? Like that does not make sense. Why would a phone be connected to the wall? And so this logic, I think, is important to appreciate with kids. But at the same time, this is a great opportunity to set them up for success for a future of agency and control and privacy that they can do. So um, we need to start first by saying, what are the what is the AI that we're going to use and trust? And then how do we explain to them that, hey, by the way, this algorithm is fallible. What you see isn't going to always be perfect. And so, for example, with sleep rings and sleep stuff like the, the deep sleep, the REM and all of that, those aren't always very accurate. Um, what's more important is to see what is their best accurate part. So you know what part to trust more and what part to trust less. So for example, for the aura ring, it's 90% accurate for the heart rate. So and the heart rate can show you how well you've rested or if you're recovering from something. So I tend to put a heavy weight when I look at the results in the morning. I tend to put a heavy weight on the on the heart rate and less on the other things. And so teaching kids like, hey, you know, this is how algorithms work. They're, they're math and statistics. They've used a lot of data to understand um, what is a normal pattern and what isn't. And sometimes they're wrong. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Dr. Um, Dr. Lydia, the sleep pillow, how does it remove noise like partner snoring and other noises during the night to ensure it can get accurate data? Um, so the, the stand one, that one uh, collects the noise and it will not remove your partner's sleep noise. So for example, if your partner's snoring, it won't remove that, it will count that. And that's a good thing that it counts that because that's part of your sleep environment. And if your sleep environment is noisy, that affects your quality of sleep as well. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Yeah, so you can just blame the partner in the morning and you have the proof. That is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what algorithm, this is from Adrian, what algorithm, algorithm is used by the um, Addict app, Addict Aid app? Do you know? Uh, I'm not familiar with what uh, algorithm they're using and I imagine it, it would most probably be proprietary. Fair. And do you think um, 
sorry, this is from Andrew. Where do you see the most potential in AI through tangible or intangible means? Um, so tangible comes with the intangible. You know, the tangible you get you get the app side by side with it. So I think um, the tangible piece is really great because of the sensors that you're getting. And that really helps improve your environment. So like uh, something else I have, which to my knowledge does not have AI in it, is a air quality sensor. But I have an app that shows me the results of it. And so I know um, exactly what's going on in my home. I know how certain cleaning um, cleaning sprays affect the quality of my air because I can immediately see it. And so I start to, to gain an understanding, but it's not that one doesn't have AI, but it, the interface is really what's key. So it's sensors and interface and then AI or just sensors and interface. Um, I think those two together really um, combined pack a punch. Absolutely. Uh, Patricia asked, do you find there is much consideration of potential privacy liability problems if data collection and storage is compromised? So like a malicious attacks and breaches become more prevalent. How can the user feel confident that their personal data will be kept safe and i think your marriott example is, is a prime one like having the kids pictures in the room like how do you keep all that safe right so this is what i meant about like the risk appetite so there's an element of trust that you say i trust this third party provider to store and uh, use good data management practices um however every time you are sharing data you are giving that data away so what i think could be good to do until we've reached a, a place of more confidence in that space um, could be to not put your name to simply not put your name on when you register your device and um, i've done that i have a separate phone for these apps and i don't use my name and obviously my name is there if i have any credit card purchases but any time that 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 profile has a separate name so that that data is combined with an, a name that's not mine. In the event of a leak, that that name that's not mine will appear with all of my data. And so that's one way to um, do OPSEC, operational security for your own data. Um, it is you want them to have that data security. I mean, you, you could trust and and still do that. I don't see why um, you couldn't have a, an extra name Great, thank you. Um, and we have one question here, which is around, um, do you think, or is there data around the society welcoming AI therapists, especially given the loneliness pandemic, where we all delight in those potential conversations that are not scheduled or not on video? You know, we're all lurking around little, um, trying to talk to someone. Is there data that shows that the, the AI as a therapist is, is on the increase? Um, is the AI what on increase? So AI and, and the coaching for AI, that's obviously on the increase and adoption is quite high. Yeah, um, I think that in the space of human performance, you'll see that take off in terms of um, the apps around exercise and all of that sleep. That one's been going crazy, like everybody's starting to do that now. Um, but in terms of the the, lo the companionship and the, the loneliness piece, I think that we don't have an option but to face that head head first because we have a, an aging population in um, Ireland, Western Europe, even industrialized countries in East Asia, Japan, Korea. So in the US as well, we have a, a growing aging pop population that is living longer, um, sometimes healthier and longer, sometimes not healthier and longer, um, but we we will have a lot of people who are home alone and will not have that companionship. And there is an element of saying, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with just as people have pets that are human live pets, why couldn't you have an algorithm pet, which do exist or you know, a robotic pet? And then the next step, which I understand is still socially contentious, is the, the life-size look-alike human doll. Um, I understand that there's discomfort in that. Um, I initially uh, felt that way, but over the years after reading more about it and um, watching High AI, which is a film that came out in the Berlin Film Festival two years ago, um, I really had a renewed appreciation for what this can do for people's well-being. And some people just um, have 
um, social anxieties that they cannot overcome. And sometimes having a lifelike human doll at home to be able to talk to, even if the algorithm isn't so great, is actually really good for, for someone to, to not commit suicide. So sometimes I think that we need to, to look beyond what we think about these technologies and, and try to understand what is the good that they can bring and where are the spaces and, and the vulnerable marginalized people in society that could benefit from them. Yeah, and I think it's a very fair point because like you're you're only projecting your own experience there. Um, one thing I'd just like to get your opinion on is when we're talking about that like post-human, like after death, recreating that person. What's your own current, because this can change, right? Personal views on that. So um, initially when I was first thinking about it, I thought, ah, this is a, this could be a really wonderful idea. Um, you wouldn't ever have to lose your loved one. You would be able to have them by your side. Um, and then I, I lost uh, my father and then I, kind of revisited that thought and I haven't drawn a conclusion yet. Um, I think that that's something that every person will feel differently about. And also it could, it doesn't have to be that right after you want it. It could be after 50 years or after 20 years where you decide, you know what, this would be, this would be nice. And you're at a different place in the healing process and all that. And so I think for every person it's different, but I do think that um, we shouldn't uh, stop trying to create that. So for example, that's for, for someone who's deceased, but you can do that for somebody who's alive right now. So Deepak Chopra has a digital version of himself and he it, it just came out um, last year, before last year, and you can interact with him. He can coach you through meditative uh, practices and uh, all of his books are there. So the algorithm is really robust in terms of how he thinks. And so, I would be very open, for example, to try and create an algorithmic version of myself to see if there's some utility in that. Could I um, have interactions with other people that would be useful to other people in an algorithmic version of myself? Um, so there's many ways to recreate yourself that could be useful in, in while you're alive. And when you think about that statement, there's not enough hours in the day, like it feels like a really good solution. <laughs> um, so uh, when you spoke about the AI features in hotels, this is going to be the last question because I know they're shouting at me to tell me to wrap it. <laughs> uh, so I could, sorry, I could talk to you all day later. Um, but when you uh, spoke about the AI features in the hotel, the Marriott example, is that happening now? Or how futuristic is that? Uh, well, they're working on it. Um, I don't know if I know that there's bits and pieces that they've embedded. So um, like part the, the wellness pieces, they have some of those options on apps. Um, but I think that it requires an infrastructure overhaul to, to kind of put those technologies inside the rooms. So um, I think that it'll be some time, but it'll probably be in strategic locations where they're going to start piloting those first. So watch out. You never yes. know. The next time you hit the Marriott, there might be like a special surprise for you. Yeah. <laughs> Lily, they're all telling me to like wrap so i just want to say like a massive thank you i've been looking forward to this talk all day and it uh, exceeded my expectations <laughs> i've seen the deck beforehand so i should have known it was going to be good but yeah real like mind bending eye opening and even just understanding your own level of risk trust all that kind of stuff like really uh, great um and thank you for sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us uh it was so lovely having you virtually today the real version um of you uh, and i will send you a snap of um the art piece when it's hanging up it's going to be in here in the event space um, Perfect. So, yeah so uh center and proud um so yeah fantastic talking to you and thank you so much for answering everybody's questions i now like to to hand over to Kevin Marshall. He's the head of education in um, Microsoft, and he's gonna wrap up our day today uh, at the John McCarthy AI Summer School day one. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Um uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, what was a marvelous tour de force of presentations over the last couple of hours. But um, let me just start with uh, a little uh, small reflection and just, just bear with me. Uh, mistress, your baby is doing poorly. He needs your attention. Stop bothering me, you fucking robot. Mistress, the baby won't eat. If he doesn't get human love, 
the internet pediatrics book says he will die. Love the fucking baby yourself. Eliza Rambo was a single mother addicted to alcohol and crack, living in a small apartment supplied by the aid for dependent children agency. She recently had been given a household robot. Robot model number Gen Row 337L3, serial number 33794278 or 781 for short, was one of 11 million household robots. So that is taken from John McCarthy's 2001 short story, The Robot and the Baby, uh, which farcically explored the question of whether a robot should have or stimulate having emotions and anticipated aspects of internet, human culture and social networking. So I think that's a perfect way in one sense to sum up uh, what we listened to today um, uh, and linking it into what uh, John McCarthy wrote over the years um, in a whole range of subjects, um, which is really worth, if you do get the time to explore his work in Stanford, um, it really just uh, leaves it to me to thank um, everyone for their efforts today, particularly the background crew and organising um, from RDI Hub and um, some folks at Microsoft who have been uh, instrumental in pulling this together. Uh, you can see the feedback um, the feedback um, link there. Um, so we're open to all feedback um, or comments on the day. Um, I really want to pay tribute to the speakers, um, Connor, Heidi, Morton and Lydia. I think they were fascinating. I mean, that there's a couple of things that struck me, just the image, I mean, the, you know, the image of the, the operating theatre from the more pristine uh, shot to actually what it looks like in the real world. It was just kind of striking. And then um, I suppose the other thing I mean, really interested in the whole sleep and the AI piece. I actually wear one of these whoop things, which is quite good at analyzing your sleep. Um, and it's just the amazing progress um, that we're making as humans and the science behind it. Um, so I really want to thank the, the speakers for what I, were fantastic performances and really insightful uh, commentary on what's going on around the world. Um, so tomorrow uh, we'll kick off with uh, Jamie and Johan from Moving Ahead, which is a really, really uh, interesting piece of work. Um, helping ch children to move better, followed on by Laura Kelly from uh, Data Analytics and the Health Beacon, which I think is another really interesting um, area of health and also received some really um, outstanding funding recently. Um, that will then be followed by the research colloquium, which will be the first, both kind of a academic piece and uh, an industry piece with Dell, MTU, McKesson and Adapt Technology Partners discussing a whole range of areas. Uh, um, and then some other uh, accelerators from Trinity. And then finally, um, there's some work from uh, Athena Analytics from Emily Brick, which is actually a really interesting piece of uh, technology um, that looks at schools, help schools think about data driven cultures. And as most well, maybe you don't know, tomorrow is the delayed results of the leaving cert. So I think uh, it'll be an interesting um, conversation as to where we're going. Um, so again, um, thank you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I will leave you with a quote from um, John McCarthy in March 89, in when he said, I don't see that human in intelligence is something that humans can never understand. And I think at that we leave it. So thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Take care.